Good evening. You are watching the Norwood Finance Commission through Norwood Community Media. We are live and meeting virtually. The official posting of this meeting uh, is on the town's website. And if you choose to have access, that is where you'll be able to see how to access this meeting. Um, I will proceed now with a roll call of attendees. Um, why don't I, I'll start with the names of the finance commissioners. Please say I, Robert Donnelly. Robert Donnelly. Judy Langone. Kelly. I'm here. I am here. Hi. Alan Slater. Aye. We also have in attendance Thomas McQuaid. Here. Molly Ahern. Here. Mark Good. Mark here. No. Um, and Emily Chambers. Here. Uh, anyone else um, participating or attending this meeting, would you please identify yourselves? Uh, in attendance in the audience, Joe Greeley, 16 St. John Ave, Norwood. Thank you. Oh, this is Matt Lane, 60 Chapel Street, Norwood. Thank you. We also have Bernie Cooper and Tony Mizuko. Correct. Anyone else in attendance? Okay, thank you. We can proceed with the, um, the agenda. Um, first thing on our agenda tonight is the acceptance of the minutes. Can I have a motion to accept the minutes or is there anything that needs to be corrected? So Bob. moved. Second. Minutes. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Judy, we, Aye. we need to hear. Thank you. Aye. Bob. We can't hear Bob. Bob. I can see him saying aye, but I can't hear him. I can't hear him either. Bob, Bob you're has, there. probably has a new button on. Nope, he's alive. We just can't hear him. If you want to vote yes, raise your hand. Thank you. Um, okay. If, if Bob wants to speak and he can't be heard, he could always dial in the telephone number. Okay. Did you hear that, Bob? I did. Oh, now you're there. Okay. You hear me? Okay. Yeah, I think I, I, I corrected the issue. All right. All right. So, um, first thing up to this evening, um, I, I think. First of all, I want to explain something. The uh, Finance Commission received an, an incredible amount of information for this meeting. There was there's a lot of things that we're going to be going over, but we needed some background information. And I have to um, thank Mr. McQuaid and Molly Ahern for getting us this information and making sure it's in a way that we could um, understand and, and sort through all of it so that we can make some good decisions tonight. So I thank you, folks. Um, the first thing that is up on this is a report on COVID-19 spending. Um, you'll have to bear with me because I'm, I'm sorry, Tom, did you have something else up on there? Uh, no. No. Okay. Putting it up now. Um, I'm going to, okay, great. Could you go over that for me or could Mr. Mizuko go over this? Uh, I can do it or? Yeah, Tom, if you Tom. want to start, then I can jump in. Okay, so uh, so basically uh, the schools are keeping track of their spending, general government's keeping track of theirs. Uh, so in general, what I did was I categorized it as to uh, if we've spent any salary and wages and then other and then whether we've encumbered anything. So now we try to categorize it. So in the case of the schools, they're, they're posting and hoping to get reimbursed the salaries for extended day programs because mm -hmm. they uh, basically, I think they're, they're still operating them. Is that right, Tony? 
Um, actually, I'll take a moment here and talk about uh, extended day. My apologies if I cut off. I'm trying to plug my laptop in at the same time. So the extended day program is not currently running. However, it's a revenue-based program. So we need to come up with the revenue to cover the cost of the program. If we weren't to cover the cost of the program, we'd have to lay the staff off. And beyond sort of the moral and the operational argument of where our goal is to keep everyone working, the way unemployment works for anyone, uh, most of the commission is uh, familiar with this, but anyone um, who may be tuning in that may not, we're a direct pay for unemployment. So we pay 70% of the cost of unemployment when somebody's on unemployment. Now, some of the recent changes to unemployment uh, supposedly have us paying only 50%, but I say supposedly because that's the kind of thing that gets posted on our website and we haven't actually gotten the bills yet. Um, the additional $600 that people are eligible for for unemployment, we're supposedly not liable for our portion of that, although I do know a few towns that have been billed for it. So if we were to lay the extended st day staff off, we would be liable for anywhere from 50 to 70% of that salary between now and June at a minimum. So that's sort of our minimum cost. Now, the risk inherent in that is that the way unemployment works, and it's a quirky system, but for anyone who's not familiar with unemployment, the system is designed to get people money when they're not working. So we may have all these different opinions on how it should work and how it should work a certain way. The system exists solely to get people money when they're not working which is my way to say every time I've challenged an unemployment claim, I've lost, but neither here nor there. So even though this program ends in June, because the way unemployment works, individuals could collect beyond the end of June. Now, in theory, if the program would start back up in September, they would go back to the program. We don't know if an if, uh, extended day would uh, is going to continue in the, uh, in, this, in the fall. The school committee, I believe, assumes it will. I believe the superintendent intends to. We just don't know what education is going to look like in the fall. That creates another issue where these individuals would possibly be able to continue to collect into the fall. Now, there haven't been any extensions of unemployment yet, but if everyone remembers back to the 2008 recession, there was an extension of unemployment. Uh, there was an additional, I think, 26 weeks given. There were some people on unemployment for 50, 60 weeks. That could happen. The latest uh, CARES Act stimulus bill, I don't know if this is number four or five, they're talking about possible unemployment extensions, among other things. So the long and short of it is, if we were to go the layoff route from a strictly financial perspective, it may be less dollars, but we run the risk of it actually being more than the total payroll cost of keeping those individuals working. Um, so it's a too much of a gamble for me to feel comfortable not just taking these costs and uh, covering these costs. I've advised the school committee as such, and uh, certainly the superintendent, because we just run a risk of actually spending more money and um, I would be willing to bet that better than 90% chance we would spend more money on unemployment than we would just finishing out these salaries through the end of June. Uh, the last 10 years, you know, unemployment insurance, if we were to have the insurance, every time we get an estimate, it's around a half a million bucks a year. In the last 10 years, we've spent just over a million dollars on unemployment. So if we'd gone with insurance where we wouldn't necessarily have this concern, we'd be looking at around between four and $6 million over the last 10 years. Instead, we spent just over a million dollars of that million, it's about 260 on the general government side and about 750 on the uh, school side. There's some issues with seasonal positions that we're trying to correct that, again, unemployment is a, a quirky system. It is designed for if somebody's getting money and then they are no longer getting money, unemployment kicks in. So they've been booking the extended day costs because we will need to reconcile that at some point. I don't believe that'll be eligible as a CARES Act expense, so we'll either need to take it from surplus elsewhere in the budget, but it's the safer bet for the use of taxpayer money. Again, beyond the moral argument that if we have the money, we should continue to keep people employed, but it's just safer than taking a risk that can end up costing us more than that payroll cost. Okay, thank you. Uh, you wanna go uh, over um, who uh, wants to Ms. talk about general government? Uh, I think Ms. Numi had a question. I assume it's unemployment related. It is unemployment related. Thank you, Mr. Rizuko. So I, that makes sense to me. We obviously don't want to lay people off and pay more. That makes absolutely zero amount of sense, right? Um, so my question comes into what happens after June, because there is an extended pr day program that runs in the summer. And then there's also the extended day program, you know, in the fall. Are we committed to continue paying those salaries through the summer and fall? Or is it just committed through the end of this cycle and then reassess in the fall? For now, it's committed to the end of June because those are technically standalone programs. It's the same staff that run the program. It's different if we know we're not running the program versus running um, versus whether or not we're um, just ending it in June. So I, I don't think the school committee has made a decision yet. We just don't know. We can look at that in the context of how the summer program looks, but we have no idea for extended day programs, for camp programs. 
it changes every day and come Monday we may have an answer. But as of right now, no idea. Same thing in the fall. At that point, you're at least giving enough notice that we're not running this program and it's going to be a long time before we're running the program. It's effectively we're choosing not to continue or we're choosing not to run a separate program versus this is an ongoing program that we'd otherwise be cutting right in the middle. The operational decision is really the um, the school committees to make and then we'd have to have that discussion once we know what we're able to actually do. Which okay. at this point, Thank you. No, no idea. Thank you, Mr. Mizuka. That was helpful. Thank you. Okay. A anybody else? We're all set. All right. Can we? And, by Alan? A uh, question uh, for, for Tony. It you may not be able to answer it because it's in the school side, but uh, I know that the uh, school system is providing uh, meals for a number of people, which is a great program. Uh, any idea whether that's uh, potentially reimbursable to us as a COVID expense? So there's uh, a couple of answers to that. If it's the the breakfast and lunch program is funded through the USDA National School Lunch Program, so that's funded as it otherwise would be. Mm -hmm. We might not continue through the um, through the summer. There are a couple of waivers that the state and federal government need to give that they traditionally do give that you never know um, that uh, would would need to take place for that to happen. Our ability to fully fund the breakfast and lunch program at 100 percent our cost is probably limited because you're looking. Thirty, forty thousand dollars a week. However, if we had to fill in a couple of gap weeks, uh, the money we'll be getting from the CARES Act will be able to cover food programs like that. Uh, that money would quickly be expired if we had to do it for fifteen weeks at thirty to fifty thousand dollars a week. Mm -hmm. Any gaps there, as well as the evening family meal program, not covered by the um, donations, we can we believe we can use CARES Act money for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? We're all set. Okay, Tony. Uh, Tony or Tom? So, Tony, so you're on a roll, Tony. Go, go ahead. Okay, if you want to just um, adjust the spreadsheet a little bit so we can look at a few more of the general government numbers. Um, I don't know if you're able to. There we go. So, it shows a total of about, uh, looks like $140,000. I can't see the top of the headed category. That number is, I wouldn't say it's understated, but uh, one of the challenges we're having, if you look at what our total expense is gonna be by the time this is over, is we're facing supply chain issues like a lot of other organizations. There would be another $200,000 worth of PPE costs in there if we could physically buy $200,000 more of PPE. We, like a lot of organizations, are sort of running on a short string, or shoestring, I should say, in terms of actually getting and securing PPE. The, we believe that 100% of these costs are going to be reimbursable through the CARES Act. So normally we were just hoping on that FEMA reimbursement, which comes years later. But we uh, received notice today that our uh, federal CARES Act money coming through the state will be able to cover these expenses. Um, they do intend to go up. We do have some fire overtime that we're trying to separate out from the budget. We've been allocated for FY21, and, uh, sorry, for FY20 and FY21, about two and a half million dollars in CARES Act funding. Now that'll cover eligible emergency expenses. It's slightly expanded funding um, from just what FEMA reimburses, and this is coming from the state. That is 21, 20 and 21 money. I would assume that we will expend that entire amount once it's all is said and done. Sometimes emergencies are cheaper at the beginning, sometimes they're cheaper at the end, but we know that for schools to get open, for certain municipal facilities to get open, we're gonna have huge PPE costs and equipment costs, some of which we already would have done if we could have simply gotten uh, the materials yet if you knew how difficult it was to get four digital thermometers in one box of paper masks it's, it's just it's an immense logistical uh work just to get it done so what we'll be doing with our emergency expenses and we're able to you know we can't cover revenue losses so unfortunately we can't just say great i'm going to put in for a million dollars of our cares act allocation and, and you know offset a revenue loss uh, we do have costs that we can allocate to it that will make sure we not only end with no uh, deficit for the year, but we're able to um, not generate free cash, but we have some sunk costs that we'll be able to move over, which we think will be helpful, as well as covering everything uh, that we've spent to date. The we won't One get moment, Tony. May, may no. I interrupt, please? Sure. Um, so we've actually been officially notified that we're going to get 2.5? Yes. Love to see that letter. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, they've sent it out to uh, the managers and the mayors across the state. It's That's the maximum we're eligible for. Yeah. Uh, for FY20 and 21, um, we will certainly make sure we are expanding the maximum because we're going to need to. I mean, there, there's, a, there's a lot of needs that, especially getting school open in the fall and as we look at reopening that we're going to have. And again, our PPE, like every community, like every um, public safety agency, is low. Our socks aren't where we would want them to be um, if – everything had to open up tomorrow we have nowhere near 
the needs what we have. Um, I know I've talked to Dr. Thompson, they're going to have some technology needs. It has to be specifically related to COVID. So yeah. it couldn't be something otherwise budgeted. But this is basically 25% of the state's allocation from the CARES Act that I'll, I'll be honest with you, Massachusetts is being fairly generous in making sure that they're giving cities and towns something. It is 20 and 21 money. It's not money that we lose if we don't spend it. I mean, if we didn't spend the whole amount, we don't get it back. But We've got to submit a pro forma FY20 budget. We'll get money for that within a couple of weeks. And then we submit an FY21. So it isn't, at least for now, in between the two fiscal years, use it or lose it. So if we say, darn, we didn't realize we needed gowns for the airport, you know, making something up. Um, and then in September, we realize we actually need them. We still have that ability to go and do it. It's not a ask on a case by case basis. We've got to come up with our budget. We know that we're going to have heavy public health uh, expenses. We're going to need sort of reserves, if you will, or, or we can't allocate that whole amount of money. We know that we'll have additional testing costs. The health department wants to make sure that we keep some money available if a vaccine does become available and we have some mobilization costs around that. Um, we'll probably have some temporary staff costs closing out this year and going into next year. So we feel confident that uh, the two and a half million is going to be well spent and is going to make sure that we don't have any deficits. Um, it is not uh, play money, and uh, we had a couple of calls with the state today, so I often like to make the joke that, oh, wow, we got $2.5 million to spend. Well, did you see how bad these roads, how good these roads were before COVID, and now COVID, you know, we got to pave a few more roads, but the state's made it clear it's got to be a COVID-related expense. The state is making a good-faith effort, and so is the federal government through the state to make sure that we can cover our COVID-related expenses. It is wider and more expanded than the typical FEMA reimbursement. One of the catches that the state has said is we will likely need to turn our FEMA reimbursement over to the state when we do get it. We're fine with that because whether we spend it now and take it out of free cash and then get FEMA money sometimes three, four, five years later, we much appreciate the state's approach of here's the money now and when you and we're required to still file for our full FEMA reimbursement. When we get that back, the state has said that that will go to the state. Now, they may be generous if it's a couple of years down the road and still give it to us, but we um, we don't know yet. We've been told the money can't be converted into uh, revenue for FY21. However, the state did say that that may be a possibility as things change uh, going down the road. But even then, there wouldn't be much of this available for uh, offsetting revenue expenses if they did go make that change. Um, you'll notice as you look through our costs and some of these that we antici anticipate increasing, food security is a big cost. PPE is obviously a huge cost. That rental cost will continue to go as there's some equipment we're finding on a temp basis that we may look to purchase, but we've got to balance what's truly temporary versus what you purchase. Uh, technology is a ongoing uh, cost and will continue to increase. There's a couple of software platforms we've deployed. We've obviously had to get people more devices. This is another area where if we had more devices, we would buy them. There's now a backlog in getting laptops and other equipment that we, um, we do need. We need to remember that you know, May 18th is when the governor is going to announce this plan. The world doesn't go back to normal on May 18th. We may have some facility closures and some work from home for arrangements for a long time. We'll also need to um, ensure that we're prepared to go back to where we are now if things do normalize. And then unfortunately, we have to take a step back. That needs to be done. There's a lot of uh, adjustments we're going to have to make to our physical spaces to allow the public back in. We have to order everyone seeing plastic shields go up anywhere. In, in and of themselves, those aren't terribly expensive. Sometimes they're 100, 150 bucks a piece. But when you look at the number that we need to order, we may need to set up some short-term temporary workspaces where we have offices that if they're fully staffed and individuals can't work from home, we may need to take up a couple of meeting rooms to just make sure we can ensure some physical distancing for the staff. So there comes you know, associated costs with that. So we're gonna get all of our costs back. We're gonna be cautious. We're gonna focus on what our COVID expenses actually are but we wanna just be a little slow in applying for our funding just to make sure that we don't miss something or realize we shouldn't have done something. And we will need a time for our budget to eventually absorb what will become the new normal. I, I can tell you that masks being available in public buildings at some point, that's going to become a new normal that you'll go in and there'll be masks provided. We'll have sanitizer stations once we eventually get to opening up and town hall could open up in two weeks or three months, we don't know yet. But um, there's going to be a short-term increase in those costs, and it'll take us some time to balance that out in the budget and know what our regular costs are uh, going forward. Okay. Does anybody have any questions on any of the um, itemized I the items that have been uh, <laughs> written here in the columns, like um, the rentals? What what would be what are rentals? Totally. So a couple of things, we're renting three vehicles so that we can maintain one man and one, uh, one man or one person to one truck at the DPW. Uh, it's a CDC and DPH uh, 
guideline that you not have people working together unless they have to. So normally we just have a couple of guys in one truck. We're maintaining the one truck, one uh, one person, one truck uh, rule, if you will. So I know we have DPW truck rentals for a period in there. We have had to rent a tent for the fire department. The tent then had some damage, but that was to cover the uh, the truck. So that's a rental um, cost as well. Madam Chair. Kelly. Hello. Hi. I was. Go ahead, Bob. All right. Um, the eleven thousand four hundred dollars for elections. Is, I'm assuming that's to cover the uh, the uh, touchless election for the um, upcoming. Um, municipal um, election or is it all that plus the fall elections? Uh, no, so that's uh, primarily the cost for the shield for the election. Some of the cost of the election is in the PPE because we have had to uh, order PPE. Um, the That's not a staff cost for the election. We may need to allocate some additional staff depending on how it works, but that's really just the physical equipment to ensure a, uh, a no touch election. Most of that equipment, the PPE obviously isn't reusable, but we've got enough of it that if we have, uh, depending on what the turnout is, we should have enough to go forward for the fall elections. And the physical barriers that we're uh, building or having made for us, those will last several election cycles. So some of this is an investment of equipment that we're gonna have for uh, the foreseeable future. Okay, Kelly. Um, so thank you very much for that overview. That was, that was great, Mr. Mizuko. Um, one of the questions I have is I know with our public safety runs, um, for instance, the ambulances, we're running extra, um, extra teams or we have an extra ambulance on call because of the cleaning that has to happen when someone actually goes in the ambulance. Um, I assume those costs would be eligible to be reimbursed. They would. It's really for fire. It's uh, we're only up staffing one person and we may actually go down that one extra body uh, because the run numbers really haven't increased. A COVID run does take a little bit more time to manage, but we've actually had a few days without any COVID runs. So that's something that will get allocated in that we'll get from the CARES Act back. And that, that's where it's one of those costs that that'll effectively generate free cash. That's not the intention of it, but it gets absorbed in our budget. It will get moved over as an expense because we only are adding that body for that person. We also have some cases where due to an exposure, a firefighter has had to stay home for a few days. Those That overtime cost is a... Um, COVID eligible expense. So we're teasing through those right now, but it, it, it's a manual process to go through and say, okay, you know, Mark Good was out on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and uh, we called in this person to cover that shift and, and making sure that we can justify and we have the backlog to show that it's strictly a COVID related additional cost, but that's allowed under our CARES Act reimbursement. So you'll see those pop into the salary cost. Um, we have some part time salary costs where we've brought in either part time or seasonal staff and said, hey, we need you to work on this or that, that will get allocated. Uh, to there as well because they're still specific to COVID operations. Okay, okay, cool. Judy, Judy, wait a minute. I turned my mic on. Tony, <clears throat> under the uh, expended, uh, the encumbered, the hundred and forty thousand. Are you saying that hundred and forty thousand came from free cash? That's the source for that. No. So, are you asking how we're able to deficit spend? uh with the town's budget is that the root of the question so I'm sorry i didn't hear that so I Judy and every, and everybody that we have we have uh you know various times like today we have 60 million dollars in cash so that's where it's coming from you know our general cash but basically uh you know we were allowed under the uh both the Civil Defense Act and the CARES Act to, to deficit spend, just like snow and ice. Yeah, that, that's Tom's right. That's exactly how it works. Now, we're particularly lucky as a community that we always have a fund balance. We always actually have cash in the bank. There are some communities that have serious cash flow issues that if they had to come up with $100,000, they can't do it. Interestingly enough, the state is actually allowing the CARES Act money to be used for cash flow if you need it. We're fortunate as a community that we wouldn't need to. Uh, that doesn't mean that's additional money available to spend. You always have to reconcile it at the end. Uh, and that's only under our authority when there's a declared state of emergency. So nine times out of 10, it's no emergencies. Um, in this particular case, whereas the governor declared a state of emergency and we did locally, we're able to deficit spend. And then at the end of the year, you're reported to the director of accounts um, via a letter from Tom saying, this is what we deficit spent. Interestingly enough, because of the way the CARES Tony, Act is working. Tony? Yep, I think yep. Mrs. Langone has a further question. Okay. Yes, Judy. So, Tony, this is money that we have in the bank. 
And because it's an emergency and we've been, you've been given the power, you can just go and get it without any oversight, any discussion. Just go and grab it and spend it the way we think we should spend it. Correct. When there's a state of emergency declared both locally and by the governor, we have the authority to deficit spend directly to uh, related to the emergency. Okay. And that kind of leads to another question. Uh, uh, how is that? How is that decided, Tony? Are you the only person doing this, or is this with discussions with the selectmen? Uh, how is what decided? I guess would be my. Uh, how is it decided? Uh, what what we need and when we need it? Who who decides? You or are the selectmen oh, involved in it? Remember or what? that. So there's there's a couple of answers to that. It's generally the manager and the assistant manager is the emergency defense director. So Bernie has held that role for a while. So it's under the authority of the civil defense director, which in this case is actually Bernie, who reports to me as his appointing authority. And he works under the supervision of the uh, general manager, or in this case, the appointing authority for the civil defense director. Now, we do have an incident command team, which is standard process for managing an emergency. That command team is myself and Mr. Cooper, Kathy Carney, and then Segal and Stacy from the health department. So any major decisions, we run through the command team. We take a public health focus, but these are uh, otherwise the established laws in the Commonwealth for managing an emergency. Okay. And again, our, our, our authority to spend money is related to the emergency. The language in the Civil Defense Act does relate it to the emergency. So as much as I'd love to go pave roads, and I like to make that joke, um, that's something that would end up coming back and getting us into uh, trouble if we said, well, it's an emergency, I got to go pave 100 miles of road. Right. Okay. Thank you. Plus, I just want to point out that the oversight comes in meetings like this, where, you know, we publicly display what we're spending and people get to, you know, question the cost, you know, does it seem like a legitimate thing? And and obviously, you know, if, if there was something that someone thought was inappropriate, it would certainly come to light. That's pretty much why we're having this meeting, besides voting on the budget. So, okay, anybody else? We all set to move on to, um, Tony, the next thing in this these columns is the Norwood Fund. Can you talk about that? Sure. So the number in the Norwood Fund for expended is actually quite a bit higher than that because there's internal transfers that we need to make the way we set up the Norwood fund is it's really four separate funds because we have existing intake processes. So the money gets divided into the four different pots. One is actually the senior center gift fund. Um, and that's Carrie's fund that she uses for uh, it's their donation fund to take care of seniors in need. There's a veterans fund. Uh, there's the gift of warmth, which is managed by Kathy in my office. And then we established one just specifically for food security to help cover some of the costs we're say facing for food security or food insecurity issues. So the reason we did that is we we don't intend this to be permanent. Um, at, I mean, we've always maintained the small donation funds when somebody wants to give $100 to the veterans agents, take care of veterans. These funds usually run a couple thousand dollars in and out of them at the, um, any given time. We know there's gonna be a temporary increase and then it'll go away and we'll go back to normal. We don't have any intention of continuing to do this six months or a year from now. If that was the case, you would spin it off into a separate um, 501c3 and we wouldn't really get involved in it but most cities and towns are doing some sort of fundraising to have money available for some of these quasi social services that we just normally don't budget for or normally aren't able to provide uh, under the context the coa um and the gift of war the coa carrie has an intake process similar to what she uses for uh determining aid for seniors the gift of warmth fund follows the um the heating assistance fund that we also uh that that's federal money follows those guidelines. And then Teddy uses his intake process, which is what they normally use if a veteran's applying for the chapter 116 benefits. So we made sure, and then with, with the food security, we still run it through sort of one of those processes, just because we didn't want to have to create a new intake process, if you will. Um, we wanted to use existing systems that are based on uh, guidelines that are out there and that exist to make sure that as money comes in, we're able to distribute it. I know Gift of Warmth is at about, uh, has spent about $3,800 as of earlier in the week. And Gift the Warmth provides assistance with utility bills. I know Teddy was telling me he's probably out about 2,500 bucks so far for helping veterans. And sometimes these are just supplementary services beyond their chapter 116, or it's Teddy's aware of his clients who are veterans in need and it's food assistance, or it could be other items that the veterans end up needing. And Carrie has told me she's at about maybe the same amount, 2,500 to um, $3,000. And a lot of that is also food aid for some seniors and some other assistance for seniors as well. Included in that total is Norwood Bank's donation. Uh, they gave quite a large donation. It's the first half of it. That is specifically segregated for the weekly family meals program for 
May and June. So that amount of money is in there, but that's been targeted specifically for that process. And will that cover May and June? Uh, yeah, Nora Bank has been incredibly generous. They've said that they'd give us thirty thousand dollars each month, and then if it ran over, they would uh, they would cover whatever the additional um, cost of that is, which is particularly helpful because not only it covers the whole pro program, but we're the food security need is huge. I mean, we had Ernie Bach ran an event. He gave away five hundred turkeys on Wednesday, and yeah. we were thinking, gee, who's going to really go get a turkey in May? And we were worried that we'd end up with a couple hundred turkeys left, and all of them went. Um, so we were worried we'd have a panic trying to find a place to store 400 or something turkeys but so the need is great if there was a million dollars in here we could do a million dollars because all we're really doing is temporary short-term aid and right now it's still one term it's, it's mainly one time we haven't yeah. really had funding available to be able to go back and say okay let's check in with some of these families who we know we've helped before and has their situation improved um okay. so we'd like to start that sort of second string of making sure we're we're trying to help everyone we know is in need but the need is always going to exceed our um, our ability to help I, people. I think Mrs. Legon. Yeah, had... Tony, I have a question on the Norwood Fund in general. Sure. If, I sent a, if I sent a check in and to the Norwood Fund, but I really wanted to go to the COA fund to help with the uh, yeah. tax situation for the elderly, how does that work? If I just send it in, Norwood Fund, do you distribute it? How, how does it happen? There's... There's a couple of different things. The senior tax donation fund is is separate. So we're not taking anything from the Norwood fund and paying property taxes because there, there is funding available through the senior tax donation fund. When we set it up, if you go looking at uh, the documents we had provided, unless otherwise requested, the money is divided evenly among the four different, if you want to call them sub funds. We did tell people if they want to make a donation to a specific area, they're welcome to. We sort of created the fund as an overarching structure because we didn't want $50,000 in one category and not be able to use it and then no money in another category where we really have the need. So if you wanted to send in a donation to have it go to a specific area, you're always welcome to do that. This was our umbrella, our way of making sure we're trying to split the money up evenly. Uh, sometimes people, especially corporations, come in and say, hey, we want just for this smaller segment of the population. And sometimes that's good. But then we didn't want, you know, a million dollars for uh, people who live on Manhattan Street and then no money for people who live on Washington Street, as an example. So a donation made out to the Norwood Fund, you would distribute it through the four funds as, as you see fit, which uh, is fine. Uh, no, evenly. Evenly. Okay. All right. Thank you. I, I have, okay, Kelly. And then Kelly and then Bob. Kelly. So, so that's all, that's all great. I think that's wonderful. Who administers those, those funds in terms of who, um, decides where the money goes from each of those funds, how it's dispersed, who, so the, who's really the administrator of that? The the COA, because they're existing funds, the COA gift fund is the Council on Aging Director. The Veterans Fund is the Veterans Director. And Gift the Warmth has always been um, managed out of the manager's office going back. Kathy manages it in my office. So the Gift the Warmth Fund, for instance, John Carroll started that years ago. I don't, I mean, we send out donation letters, I think every other year or something for it. I don't know who gets access to the gift mm -hmm. of the walk fund. Kathy does it. She checks on the status with the light department. Kathy, Teddy, and Carrie all communicate, but we keep everything confidential in terms of who's actually getting aid. We just sort of do a, a back of the envelope check to make sure that we're not constantly, uh, not that we don't want to always help the same person. Sometimes they may need help from a couple areas, but to make sure that we're not always giving somebody um, one person aid and not somebody else. And again, so the intake process we use is similar to what the COA, it, it's the COA has an existing intake process as does Teddy. So that's where somebody sort of comes through it. Now, similar to the schools where they know some of their families who are in need. <laughs> What's heck it, Tony? Yeah. Um, Tony, are you aware that in section seven of the charter, the town's charter, we have a board of relief. We have the ability to put into place a board of relief. Um, and it's, um, the, the wording is a little archaic, but um, it would be three people who were appointed annually by the selectmen. And um, basically, the, they shall perform duties and ex ex exercise powers of overseers of the poor of said town. Um, I, I think that might be something, you know, this, this, um, emergency that we've had is certainly woken us up to to the needs of the other of all of the people of the town. 
if we hadn't, so, uh, if that uh, hadn't happened before. But I, I think that just going forward, and I'm sorry, Bob, I jumped in ahead of you. I apologize. Um, but I think that's something that, you know, as Kelly brought this up, it, it, it might be something that we should, or the selectmen, because it, it's in their um, area so of expertise in the charter. So. Yeah, a couple uh, of things on that, Ann. Um, the Board of Relief in the town was actually eliminated in the late 60s when the state took over local welfare services. And oh, boards okay. of relief actually replaced overseers of the poor. And our charter actually made the selectmen the overseers of the poor. They eliminated that office. Cities and towns used to provide welfare at the local level. Um, cities right. and towns actually used to run poor houses. So when you hear about, oh, you know, my electric bill is driving me to the poor house, we literally, every city and town literally ran a house that if you were destitute, you went to. Those all went away when we no longer provided municipally funded welfare services. So a border relief wouldn't, first of all, we don't intend to do this beyond our normal couple of funds um, once we're on the other side of this. So a border relief would be appropriate for municipal funded. This is not municipal funded. These are donations. We have to spend donations okay. in manner in which they take. And again, right. we're pushing the Norwood fund because we know there's a need. Would, there, would it be a good idea down the road to possibly set something up like that? Yes, but you would almost want to separate that from the town and just have it be a 501c3 like circle of Foundation. hope. Yeah. Not our normal course of business. This is sort of, it's an emergency. Let's do what we can do, take care of people. And then at some point this needs to go, go by the wayside. Okay, Bob. So thank you, Tony. Um, it's great that the Norwood Bank has made such a, a, a generous donation. I, seeing that this is a public meeting, we're being broadcast. I think it might be an opportunity for, for you also to uh, inform anybody who else who is interested in donating to the fund. How would they go about doing that? So thank you very much, Bob. You're 100% right there. There's a couple of ways you can do it. You can actually go online to our website and right where you would pay your normal municipal bills, there's a link there that you can donate online to the Norwood Fund. And Unibank, who's our payment provider, has agreed to waive the charge for May and June for um, uh, or for April and May for any online donations. You can also mail a check into the town and just have it uh, made out to the Norwood Fund. Uh, those are the two primary ways you can do it. If for some reason you wanted to give cash, the only way we would be able to do that is you can go to the Bank of Canton main branch in Canton or the Norwood Bank branch, and they will uh, exchange your cash for a check payable to the town. Uh, and individuals can give, businesses can give, and 100% of the money goes directly to helping people. We don't take a, an admin overhead. We don't buy you know, our supplies with it or whatever. It goes to seniors, veterans, people who need uh, assistance with food, and people who are, are having trouble paying their bills. Um, again, if we had $10 million in there, we could pay, we could do rental assistance and mortgage assistance. The numbers are small, so really we help with food and some bills. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, what? Yep. Well, so thank you, Tony, for that. I'm making my donation right now. We appreciate it. <laughs> um, okay, any, any other questions on those funds? No? Seeing none, we're going to move on. All righty. Um, I wanted to I wanted to thank Mr. McQuaid for sending us a trial balance on um, all of the different funds that we have revolving funds and um, uh, uh, and about the and I had requested information on the grants so we did get some information. Does anybody have any questions on the revolving fund or funds or the grants at this time? No. Okay. Great. Um, and um all right so the next thing we're down to would be revenues anticipated shortfalls is mark good with us yes i am okay mark um could, could do you have anything that you want to update us with on the revenues and the anticipated shortfalls um I think that uh, Tom has prepared the uh, spreadsheet that he has up there. Okay. And I, I think those are, are fairly, uh, they look good. Um, I think he did a good job of estimating the possible shortfalls there. Um, so um, if you take a look at that and have any questions, or if Tom Tom has any uh, any comments? Well, so let me just say that on uh, you know we usually break down by <clears throat> first departmental receipts, which the budget for the for fiscal twenty is fifteen million two thirty eight eight thirty five, uh, based on 
what I think we're going to get in. Uh, we should have a surplus there of 453,000. Uh, and then, you know, some of the specific lines, if you look at, uh, you know, payments in lieu of taxes, you know, we've already collected everything we're going to collect uh, in that case. And uh, as far as I know, there might be one or two people that still have to pay, but, uh, and, you know, ambulance receipts, you can see here by this formula that I just used, uh, you know, what we're collecting every month as, as the, uh, the basis, same, you know, same with rentals. And, uh, you know, most of these items are that. Uh, recreation, where we don't, don't have any programs going on right now, I just assume we're not going to collect any more money. So, you know, I'm anticipating a revenue shortfall in that case. Uh, and again, most of these, I, I just took a 10 month average. Uh, this one here, we, we always get the Medicaid reimbursement at the end of the year. So, I'm assuming we are going to get that. Uh, th these three in yellow, it, it's uh, collectively it, as a group we budgeted two million three sixty one. Uh, and if you look at, uh, you know, the big the biggest items in there are the, the meals tax and the hotel motel tax. And so obviously not a lot happening in meals or motel hotel. So I'm just being very conservative. I think here. And saying that we're going to only get fifty thousand over the two month period for meals tax and fifty thousand for excuse me hotel tax, and then uh, you know we'll get some jet fuel tax. The planes are still running, so um, so I'm anticipating a shortfall there of six hundred five thousand uh, dollars, but collectively for uh, positive. That, that when you look at utilities, those are a little more difficult to analyze by themselves if you just look at revenue. So, uh, but based on water, based on the fact, uh, assuming we you can see here, I did the same formula, you know, using a pro rata, you know, we should be right on and maybe a little bit of surplus on water. Uh, what appears to be a deficit in both light and broadband really is not because I'll remind people that we overestimate the purchase of power so that we have flexibility at the light department in case there's a, a spike in the cost to, to get power. They don't have to run back to town meeting and get it. So they overestimate the cost and then they put a like amount in revenue. So uh, I just want to show you on uh, on the second page here, you know, the, these are the, uh, <clears throat> there's that deficit, 3 million, 315 of uh, deficit in the revenue, but there's also, we anticipate around $10 million in uh, cost savings over what's in the thing. So, you know, we should generate about, like we usually do about $7 million from the light department. So we're kind of really right on schedule. I didn't bother doing that with the broadband, but it's a sim similar analysis. So, um, so I think for this year we're we're going to be okay. Obviously, the big question on revenue is is next year. So, uh, so I think everyone understands that uh, to guard against that, we'll spend two point seven million dollars on uh, capital equipment. So we're not going to do that now. Uh, we're delaying any decision on capital equipment aside for some small things like school vans that we need to get. Uh, so we're going to delay any decision on capital until the fall. Uh, and the capital that we do do proceed with, we're going to borrow. So and obviously we have really good borrowing rates. So, so whatever free cash we generate from this year, plus the $2.7 million that we're already going to have, uh, that'll be a pretty good cushion. Uh, and, and I think everyone knows we're putting another $540,000, I think it is, into the stabilization fund. Uh, and, we and we're and we putting uh, 700000 in the, the override stabilization fund. So we have, I think, pretty good reserves. Uh, I think the, the revenue that might get affected 
is hotel motel tax and uh, and and uh, food meals tax. Uh, collectively, you can see the budget for those is two point three million dollars. So uh, even if we got zero on that, that that would be let's call that two million dollar shortfall. Even if we got zero, which I don't believe it's going to be that bad, but uh, this potential there uh, and in local aid we from the state we get about 15 million dollars and you know depending on which article you read potentially state uh, local aid could go down by 20 percent so if we took a 20 percent hit on 15 million dollars that would be three million dollars and uh, so if we had that three million dollar hit and this two million dollar potential hit there's five million so we'll probably have that covered just by the free cash but uh if not we have the money that's going into the stabilization stabilization funds as well okay and i think that's personally that's to me that's worst case scenario okay uh let's start with bob so um yeah this is um really interesting. I guess my, my question would be, um, as we go on this sheet particularly, how soon would we know the, uh, I know you have projected numbers there for excise meals and ex and, and, and room um, hotel tax. So how soon do we be able to, to look at the projected versus what we actually collected in those, those two categories? You mean for this fiscal year? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Early July. Okay. And yeah, um, those, those state distributions, the quarterly distributions will come out on June 30, we'll actually receive funds. Thank you. So this uh, the next question has to do with just um, looking at paying attention to our, our trends, if you will. Um, so I'm, I'm just really uh, interested in our abilities to, to make sure that we're able to take a look at these early indicators or as soon as we have the information available as to what is the trend actually um, for our various categories. And um, I would include in that, you know, as we go forward, we, we know we have our trend information in the budget book regarding our property tax collection. And I would throw into the mix regarding um, trending that as to how soon do we know? Right now, I think we're, we're, we're collecting property taxes in the vicinity of 99% uh, of our taxes collected. If we start to see some slippage in that, that might be an indication to us that we might have a, a revenue problem, maybe not. But how soon would we be able to um, pro, you know, take a look at what our property tax collections are, are trending at? Is there, a method, is there an opportunity to do that? I'm throwing it out there. I don't need an answer right now, but I just I'm thinking. actually looking at it every day, Bob. Um, you know, today we're, we expect to collect 84 million bucks in property tax. To date, we've collected 80 million. <clears throat> um, so uh, I think our next um, point of measure will be when uh, they're actually due now, and that's June 30. Um, the collections have slowed down, um, and that could be because people are waiting until June 30 to pay that. Um, so, uh, you know, we'll know more June 30. Uh, certainly, you know, where a cash flow has, has stopped, nearly stopped, um, I, I think we can expect those numbers, the 99% to, to fall, um, but to what extent is going to be hard to, to tell at this point until we have that, that June 30 number. Um, on the uh, purchase of power, we've seen about a 10% a drop since March. So that $2.3 million bill that has been coming in is now $2 million. So we know we're using less energy and you would expect that to um, translate in your revenues as well. So, uh, you know, we'll continue to watch that one. Um, 
motor vehicle excise, we, we know that sales are down 20%, how that will uh, reflect in terms of actual collections of, of the motor vehicle excise tax. What's the number? 20%? Maybe. I don't know. Not Certainly not uh, this year. We will not see that kind of drop. I think we'll, we'll end 2020 okay, but what's that going to look like in 2021? Hard to tell. But we're, we're keeping an eye on those numbers. Okay, thank you. Um, I just think, um, that's great. I appreciate that. And I just think it's probably something that as we get into our summer period, the FinCom may May, may ask again for maybe a summer meeting, you know, to take a look at that that trend again. And um, I, I appreciate your, your final comment, uh, Mark, because I think, uh, um, you know, I, I think we're going to, FY21 is going to be the, the, the year, which is um, going to be challenging. But I think going forward, we're also have to start thinking about what impact this probably could have in our FY22 budget. This, this is the long-term issue that we'll be dealing with. But thank you for the trend information. That's great. I, I, I think that's um, that, that shows we have the information available and uh, needed um, and available for us when we need it. Thank you. Alan. Uh, thank you. Um, again, thank you, uh, Mark Good. Uh, that was uh, very interesting. Uh, I also share some of the concern you have that the issues we're going to have may not necessarily be as bad in this upcoming budget. Uh, as they potentially could be in uh, FY22, but you know, none of us have uh, ever been uh, mistaken for Connac the Magnificent with that crystal ball, so it's a little bit difficult to come up with numbers, but there are a few things that I am concerned about. Uh, first of all, I think it was great, you know, based on our financial policies that uh, for our estimated receipts, we only used slightly more than 90% rather than 100%. That does give us a little bit of cushion. Uh, if we used 100% uh, for FY21, as we've had in the past, I think we'd be in real trouble. But since we're using 90% of uh, previous year's estimates, I think we're probably not in that bad shape. However, you know, there are a few areas that I am concerned about uh, for FY21. You know, Mark already noted uh, excise tax. Again, it's difficult to estimate. I suspect they will be lower. Uh, Tom McQuaid has already noted uh, hotel, uh, motel, and meals taxes. Uh, what I did uh, note here is that looking at uh, what we have in our budget book for uh, for uh, excise taxes, uh, you know, meals, room, other, you know, which includes ship, fuel, or whatever. Uh, for those three in total, for FY21, we had a one million eight hundred fifty-nine thousand as our estimate. That was I, I, again, I, I assume it's a pre-COVID uh, nineteen estimate. Uh, what we're expecting this year uh, from those numbers are uh, a little more than one point seven million dollars. So even though for about eight eight nine months of the year, you know we really didn't have much of a problem uh you know once COVID hit the numbers really uh, went down significantly and i'm concerned that that trend may continue for a good portion of uh 20 uh, of uh, fiscal uh, fiscal 21. i mean that is a real concern uh, again we don't know what the number will be what the reduction will be but i'm concerned that it's going to be a very significant reduction uh, I was already noted on recreation that right now we don't have any programs. Who knows when we will have programs. So the number that we have uh, for uh, recreation, 240 some odd thousand dollars, you know, is uh, a number that that is in question. Uh, I'd also like to, to note the uh, uh, licenses and permits. Uh, that's a significant number. It's almost two million dollars for licenses and permits. A major part of that, as I understand, are building permits. Um, again, that's that's a that's a that's a question mark. I don't know what we're going to be having for building permits. Um, you know, in uh, in the next fiscal year, it could be more. It could be less. We had a few large ones this year. You know, such as the. Uh, uh, the Skating Club of Boston. I don't know whether we have anything that big on the horizon right now. So I think what I'm saying is, is I am really concerned about 
some of these numbers going forward. Uh, I have, again, no idea what these numbers will be, but I think it is a real concern to us uh, what things will be in the subsequent fiscal years, which makes it even more important that we're careful in FY21. And just because we have a pot of money, let's say for free cash or, or money in certain other reserves, we should use a significant portion of that in FY21 because I'm more concerned you know, because of some of these local receipts, as well as the concerns about local aid, potentially, I'm sure local aid is is hit. We may have an issue also with some of our uh, uh, circuit breaker reimbursement that we may be in real, real dire straits in FY22 and how to have enough money left in various reserves uh, to make up that difference. So, you know, that's just uh, my, my long spiel. Uh, but again, I am I am concerned about some of these numbers. Okay, thank you, Alan. Um, Kelly's next, and then Judy. Kelly. So, so thank you, thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, so I, I echo the concerns of everyone, and I echo Alan's concerns as well. Um, one of the things, you know, I'm concerned about all of the things Alan mentioned, but I'm, I'm really uh, concerned about. Um, the intake of um, of tax payments from home from homeowners, right, and from businesses, right? Those taxes that really are the biggest form of revenue that we take in. Um, and one of the things that that I've heard is that you know we really can't predict it. Which obviously in this this economy with this virus, who knows what's going to happen? Two days is a lifetime. Um, things change so quickly. But one thing I would like to see is has anyone done any analysis based on the recession in two thousand eight? to look to see in that time. Now, granted, that was a little different. It wasn't an economic shutdown, but what were our impacts on our payment rates, the real estate taxes? What, wh how much did those degrade? How, mu how much less did people spend in hotels? How much less did we generate in meal tax? It would be really good to see that as some level of comparison in, in a somewhat similar environment. Obviously, the situation's a little different, but the income, the impact on the economy is somewhat similar. It would be good to see what that downturn led to, how much did state aid go down, so that we could kind of compare it to the last time we went through a significant recession um, to see what we can anticipate happening in terms of state aid and people's ability to pay their real estate taxes. Okay. Yes, Judy? Yeah. Um, you know, we have to remember that this budget was put together and processed and we agreed to it prior to the virus. So we're walking into this with a nice, happy, little, great budget. Once town meeting approves it, assume that they approve it at this level, it then becomes a spending plan. I would like to see some kind of um, analysis of whether we should be spending what we actually just approved because fiscal 21, yeah, but um, Alan's correct, fiscal, 22, 23, we don't know where we're going at this point. And right now, um, I'm a little afraid that we are going to end up in some deficit and have to make some cuts. I do have a question for Tony uh, to ask, have you talked to other cities and towns on how they're handling this? I understand there's some very different approaches. Um, also, about a 112 budget, um, which the state does frequently. Um, putting the brakes on spending so we just don't go ahead with that pre-virus uh, budget. Can, so, hold on one minute, Tony. Um, Kelly, you didn't get an answer, and I apologize for that. I did uh, not. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's okay. It's all right. It's all good. I, I, I think I can. I, if I remember correctly, and I can't. I can't address the sales or the excise tax, uh, the meals tax, or the hotel tax, but. In terms of, of real estate tax, we didn't see, and actually I wasn't here at the time, I was in another community, but um, we didn't see the the drop off in collections in 2008, let's say. Um, I think this this time around, it's a completely different ball game. I mean, cash has stopped, literally stopped. and. So, you know, people that uh, we we have so much more unemployment. So, 
I, I think there's going to be a difference between 2008 and, and 2020, 2021. It's, uh, it, it's going to be a, a lot different, so a lot more severe, I think. I, I agree with that, Mark, but the, the other thing that wasn't here in 2008 is there is definitely more government programs being impacted to help people, and there's a larger volume of revenue being driven into the economy by the federal government. We can argue whether we should do it or not, but it definitely is happening more than in 2008. So I agree. It's a different ball game. This completely shut down the economy. The other one was more um, some – some business practices that cause us to go into a recession. So the, the consequences are different. I was just, I'm just curious. It's interesting to see that that didn't impact it in 2008. That's a very interesting thing to know. Can I make a comment here for a second? Um, you, you know, you were from in the impact of 2008, the impact of 2008 lasted, well, probably five years, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, and, and it, it was, it eroded things. It, um, if you, well, I'm going to pick on the school department budget. It, we eroded things in the school department so that then now we're, we're having to build the school department up. And unfortunately, what a time this happened. But, um, but it was, it was a slow, painful process every year that we would go to town meeting and we would cut something and we would cut something else. And then we would cut another thing and another thing. And it was, you know, it was always just chipping away at our foundations of what our, of our way of life in the town. This time we're not going to have that. This time it's just a major um, withdrawal of funds, you know, uh, that we're sort of expecting. Just because people aren't making money, they're not able to contribute. That's my thought. So go ahead, Tony. I know you were waiting to answer Judy's question. Yeah, to a couple points. Some towns are looking at cutting their budgets. I'd say maybe a third of towns are. About a third of towns are doing what we would propose we do, which is you go forward with your budget, and then in the fall you're going to have to make adjustments because you just have no earthly idea where you're actually going to be. So to try to make any adjustments now, we're grasping at straws. Um, by October, could we be in a – terrible, terrible recession? Sure. Could the economy have reopened up and there'll just be some smaller impacts? Sure, that's possible too. We know that job loss is high, but part of the reason the job loss is high right now is businesses are shut down. The governor is going to release his uh, plan on Monday and who knows what that's going to take. But as businesses start to open just as quickly as those unemployment numbers came up, you'll see some big chunks coming out of that. So uh, to Ms. Newby's point, I would think that you, there's actually probably more money in the economy right now than there was six months ago. That's not sustainable, of course, uh, due to some of the different unemployment programs. You also haven't yet seen the large scale middle class job loss that really hammered the economy in the last recession. So you haven't seen that yet. I hope it doesn't come. You never know it could come. Uh, but that's when you'll start to actually see more of a problem with foreclosures and um, mortgage payments. I mean, if you think about our sort of economic matrix in Norwood, Remember that most seniors, although they're having an impact, but if they're living on a fixed income, their fixed income is fixed. Uh, if you've paid off your home, your taxes are generally a concern, but you've got equity in your home. If you have recently purchased a home where your mortgage is the highest, that's when it's the um, sort of the biggest threat. Folks who may be 10, 15 years into their mortgage, they're more able to manage that payment because remember the price of a house bought today in Norwood compared to 10 or 12 years ago is absolutely um insane. It's almost doubled in uh, in about 10 years. So it depends. If you start seeing that middle class drop loss, you'll see that problem. Did it really hit, as Mark said, the property tax collection last time around? Not really. It drops and that impacts your free cash and your surplus revenue uh, that's available. Uh, cities and towns still, still collect property taxes. Uh, most people still end up paying their taxes. You do have some homes lost to foreclosure. If there's a mortgage on it, remember that the banks generally still pay the taxes. Uh, you could have some commercial properties that go under that are big taxpayers, and you hope that that wouldn't happen. Uh, that's where you're more likely to see a drop in revenue than on the residential side. I do know the last four recessions or so, we've never gone through a sort of mass layoff or a mass slashing, other than when we had to adjust for uh, changes to Prop 2.5 in the early 80s. But I know Bernie can confirm that, that you know because of the, the 
the nature of the economy in Norwood, if you will. We've always generally been stable. Our problem is as the economy contracts, we can't get that 4%, 5% growth in revenue we need to sort of survive on. So, you know, two and a half, we you know we can't live on just two and a half. So we need two and a half and then we need, you know, another percent to come from state aid and maybe another percent to come from local receipt. Our problem that squeezing that Ann mentioned has is that our revenues are going to generally go up. You maybe take a one big year, uh, one or two year hit. They'll always go up. They're not going up enough to cover our costs. And that's when we say, all right, well, we've got a million dollars in new revenue this year, but two and a half million dollars in new uh, expenses. The underlying economy has been strong. One figure, two figures that I think are particularly fascinating to think about. Uh, and then I'll talk about the 112th budget. We did $65,000 worth of building permits in April. So with construction shut down in Boston and Cambridge, and we did not shut down construction in Norwood, $65,000 worth of permits. That's not the construction value. That's the permit take that we took with the shutdown going on. That's actually pretty, pretty substantial. Um, a lot of smaller projects, but enough that they generated 65 grand in income. I don't know uh, what May's numbers will be. Boston's looking to reopen construction, education and healthcare, things that are short term hit hard, but are going to bounce back as much are where our sort of economy lies. So I think there's some positivity on the horizon. We just don't know for the next month or two until things start to open up. Uh, in terms of the 112th budget, you know, I've done 112th budgets before. There's never really a benefit to it because you're, you're still going to spend the money one way or another. It just becomes sort of a behind the books accounting um, nightmare. And you can make the same adjustments in the fall, plug things in the fall, because what if that 112th budget becomes, all right, well, in July, we get 112th, and then August, we get 112th, and then it's September before we know where we're setting our revenues. So if we didn't have to operate on a fiscal year, the better fiscal process would be, sure, you wait. But that's effectively what we're saying to do is we see where we are in October, see where we need to adjust money out of reserves. We know that that's not sustainable on a long term. We can't just say, well, every year, just plug it with a couple million dollars out of the bank. But there is a reason why you build reserves. It's for cases like this where it truly is an emergency. It's unforeseen. We know that if we had to take $3 million out of free cash and stabilization to plug a budget hole in, in the fall, we could do it. Could we do it the fall after? No, probably not. And then the fall after that? No, probably not. I think from a policy standpoint, we didn't just raise everyone's taxes and come this far to now just start cutting things until we know we have to. And even then, we're going to have to look at how we maintain what taxpayers are, are, are paying for. Because remember, their taxes went up last year and we start slashing their services. They're still paying the same taxes they paid last year. So we've got to do everything we can do to maintain the level of service that we have going forward. Could FY22 be a really bleak picture? Sure, it could be. Could FY22 not be that bad? That's also a possibility as well. Uh, not that we want to gamble with taxpayer money, but there's still just too much uncertainty. Now, I say this at 5 o'clock on May 14th. Could Governor Baker come out tomorrow and announce a huge cut to state aid? Sure. That historically hasn't been the Baker administration's process. And remember that Chapter 70, which is school aid, which is the majority of our state aid, is uh, you're generally held harmless. They did not cut Chapter 70 aid in the last recession. It was pretty darn near flat, uh, which is, again, effectively like a cut to us, but it's never been a hard cut. There are talks about delaying the Student Opportunities Act a year, um, which may be what they're more apt to do, which are sort of putting that as separate revenue and separate expenses, although the budget would have to absorb some of it, really is, uh, you know, came around to be a wise idea because instead of absorbing 100% of that within the budget and then having to cut the budget, a lot of that was it's supposed to be for a new program put it to the side. So, Tony, can I ask a quick question of, uh, of you? Um, yep. In terms of unemployment, obviously we're at a, a really high unemployment rate, like close to what we had during the Great Depression, biggest yep. unemployment since in my life, right? What do you know? What from a government perspective, I've never seen these numbers, so I'm wondering if you have them. Do you know what the what the number of actual RIF versus furlough is in that unemployment number? Because I think that would speak a lot to how quickly people will cover once businesses open if they're furloughed versus RIF. Sure. So I, I don't know and I haven't seen the numbers, but if you take a typical restaurant that's had a cut um, or my favorite example, movie theaters, 100 percent of the employees at that theater in Dedham are currently furloughed. Um, when that opens back up, are they going to bring 100 percent of them back? Not right away. They'll bring back 25 percent and then it'll scale up until they get to their um, normal um, capacity, normal capacity. Yeah. Um, I it's um, it's tough to see. I think it'll recover relatively quickly. Believe it or not, there are still jobs out there in the economy. If you want to go work at a grocery store or a fast food restaurant or home market foods, they are hiring like crazy. Those are not the good middle class jobs that we need to support a good economy and they don't all pay a living wage. But some of the lower wage jobs that have been lost at some point 
you'll be able to um, uh, hopefully balance out when we go there. And just real quick on our, um, you know, the moderator's calling me, on our economic matrix, there's two interesting points here. We're not directly subject, uh, subject to income tax. So somebody going on unemployment doesn't actually impact the municipal revenue. It can impact state revenues, but if they're paying state tax on their unemployment, with the additional unemployment that's out there, if the state tax is being taken out of that extra 600, the state may not see the revenue loss that they're anticipating because they're not seeing that drop in somebody's salary. So what I mean by that, if you make $1,000 a week, normally you'd make $700 a week on unemployment. The state's seeing a 30% drop in that portion of the revenue. Not necessarily the uh, the case yet. That could always change. Um, but we're the, the reason I think I said at the last meeting, we're usually a year or two years after a recession hits, we start to see it because right off the bat, it takes that year or two and then people stop going out to eat. And then you start to see that in the meals tax two years down the road. Um, you know, Usually when we see the property tax collection issue, it's a couple of years down the road. When the state starts to see it, it's a little bit more immediate. The same thing with the uh, the federal government, which just continues to print money and make it up, but that's a discussion. Okay, I'm, I'm, yes. Can I uh, address that? Tony's basically saying that there's usually a lag before the town government. Right. And uh, in, in answer to Kelly's point, I just went on to uh, gateway to the tax recap. So in 2008, our excise tax collections were 3646 They continued to go up the next year, 2009, to 3942 And then they dropped in 2010, dropped further in 11, and then started creeping back up. But it was you know, it was six or seven years after the first recession hit that we were back to normal. Right. Okay. I think uh, Mrs. Langone had her hand up first. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to, to follow up with Tony relative to waiting until the fall. We get the budget passed, a pre-virus budget. The gates open. We now have a spending plan. It would seem to me we should look very closely at that entire year's spending plan to see if we could stall making some expenditures or commitments. There are a number of people that are going to be hired as a result of that budget. Should we then hold off a little bit on spending some of that, sort of have a little break on spending till we see what the fall is doing instead of waiting to go along and you know, we're fat, dumb, and happy, and we're going to just spend right up until the fall, and then we'll figure out where we are. So th that's a good point, Judy. The challenge is that, as you know, most of our budget is already fixed, and we would be spending it anyway. So I know we like to say, well, slow spending, and that, that sounds good, and let's have a spending frost, I use the term, or spending freeze. But we've got 400 or so teachers. No matter what, even if we're adding some in the school budget, next year, we're still going to have 400 teachers. Um, we've got 60 cops and next year we're still going to have 60 cops. I mean, we may have to reduce if the budget looks bad. So, you know, what we could say, let's hold off on this or that until we know is so marginal that I think we go through, you know, a real tough exercise and really sort of make some operational challenges difficult when we just don't know. And it's still really at the margin. I mean, our, our health insurance number is, I think, $15 million or $13 million. We're going to spend that number no matter what. Um, obviously, if we had a few, a couple fewer bodies, uh, full-time uh, benefit packages, you'd spend a little less, but that's $15 million we're going to spend. The pension fund is $5 million. We're going to spend that number. So we don't have a lot of discretionary expenses that we can say, hold off on this. You'd be identifying really a handful of things. And I, I don't, don't know if it would make a difference because it's realistically at the margin. Um, plus, if you're looking at a large scale RIF or something like that for FY22, in October is when you want to start making that decision that, all right, now we know for the next year, to start leaving positions open and not filling positions to try to do it now again i think you're it's it's so marginal and a lot of those cost increases on the school side with special ed are they're there i mean they've got to spend those dollars one way or another um so there's just so little that's actually well let's just not do this because it'll help give us a cushion um you know we and we whereas we don't have a cash flow issue there's no large july payments that we need to delay uh, we could push the pension payment out if we had to. There's no real need to uh, since cash flow is there, but there's just not a whole lot of discretionary spending. I mean, one of the good things we're doing by waiting for the fall for capital, not only does it preserve our free cash, but we may come back in the fall and say, wow, if things are absolutely upturned, we may need to make a decision. But I think staying the course is the best option. 
and there, there's just not too much additional spending in the budget that's not um you know not related to some of the the non-discretionary issues the school's facing how many, people, how many people are we planning to hire in in the next fiscal year i think it's somewhere over maybe 15 20 people so I can't speak to the school budget. They have a lot of mandated costs. Um, on the general government side, it's zero. We're looking at building the facilities department, which is a net of uh, three FTEs. I and think with the schools, it's about 15. And I know what you're going to say. Well, a lot of that is connected with special ed and it's mandated. I don't think it's that high. Bob, do you think it's that high? Yes. I think it's that high, yes. Okay. 15.8 people. Thank you. How many? 15.8. 15.8. It three, seems to me three, we could slow three something optional. down. Three are optional and the rest relate to either SOAP or SMED. Okay, so three are optional. One, one of which is a teacher for classroom sizes that are almost 30. I know that. Okay, Alan? Uh, thank you, Ann. A uh, couple of points. Uh, you know, Tony talks about how things are going to change, uh, you know, once the economy gets back up and running. Uh, I'm not sure you're going to see the same thing. I think you're going to see differences, you know, between a pre-COVID and a post-COVID economy, particularly uh, in uh, many industries uh, and retail. I was just reading an article today that, you know, retail has changed. You know, people are not as likely to go to stores or more likely to go online and whatever. And within the next three years, that's a prediction that nationwide 100,000 stores uh, may close, which is three times the number in the uh, past three years. Uh, what does that mean? It means that more people will be on unemployment. Uh, um, more people uh, will have difficulty making payments. More people have difficulty making their tax payments. So I don't think we should necessarily assume that once the virus miraculously goes away, that everything is going to be the way it was before. I don't think that's uh, clearly going to be the case. Uh, secondly, you know, the, the whole point of when I was talking about uh, local receipts and, you know, uh, concerns about uh, tax collection or whatever is that we can probably scrape by uh, in FY21. But the big concern uh, that we have and we should be looking at even now is how we want to address FY22 and FY23, because if we don't start doing that now, we're going to come up to it, uh, you know, at budget time uh, in FY22, and we're just going to be up against it. We're going to have major problems, you know, keeping the programs that we have, keeping the people that we have, uh, doing the things that we've done in the past. And, you know, this isn't business as usual. You know, we have to look at these things really carefully and look at things long term, because if we don't, we're really going to be in trouble, you know, in subsequent fiscal years. I just really want to emphasize that and have people understand that we're certainly not out of the woods uh, simply because we may be able to somehow craft the budget and craft some numbers for FY21. So if anybody wants to comment. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask the board um, because I, I'm, I'm feeling that there is a general theme from what we're saying. And that is, is that either, uh, I'm, I'm gonna sort of paraphrase this, either we somehow plan to put some spending limits in place or for this uh, 2021 budget, or we ask to make changes in the budget that's being presented to us that will um allow us to keep more money maybe in a savings account or something for the next year or two years in in the future am i on the right track here board members uh, and and so i guess i'm looking i'm looking for you to for you to articulate something specific uh you know do you want do you want to um when make some changes when we get to the to the budget that we're going to be looking at and voting on tonight or uh, well not all of it but um yes bob um uh no I, I i would not be in favor of that um what i do favor is the plan that's presented to us in terms of the um 
um, preservation of the free cash to 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 take care of any untoward spending issues that we'll have. I think the plan as presented, that is revisiting the issue of capital in the fall, by the fall, when we're in special town meeting, I think we're gonna have a lot more information regarding what are the specific revenue shortfalls that were that really that really are they're not, they're on the table right now. So yeah. to to be able to articulate specific cuts to the budget without really having a good handle on what the ultimate revenue um, lines are, I don't think I would be in favor of that. So I, I would take a, um, you always have to have a plan B. And I have faith that in the schools, as well as the general government, that if we found ourselves in a position early in fiscal FY21, that our revenue shortfalls were such that we needed to, that our cash flow was that severely impacted then I believe then that would be the time. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Judy, I guess. Judy, I guess you're next. At this moment, that, 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 well, I'm, I'm not really there. That's, I guess that's okay. my thing. Judy? Well, I think, you know, my thinking is we have two approaches or two strategies on the table here. One, is just hold our nose and go forward and go forward with the pre-virus budget. Or the other one is go forward with the pre, the pre, uh, the virus budget, but be a little careful. Hold back some spending. Don't just go right into spending and hiring. Um, I, I'm not for. I, I'm all for going forward with this budget, but I think there has to be some caution and some, you know, really thinking. How soon do we start spending everything? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Alan? Uh, thanks, Ann. Uh, I agree with uh, Judy, particularly on discretionary spending. I mean, look, we're probably not talking about millions of dollars of discretionary spending, but there's always a certain amount of money, both of the town side as well as the school side, that you'd like to spend, but it doesn't have to be spent, you know, uh, uh, in July 1. It could be spent later in the year if it's necessary. And if it turns out that we do have some real monetary problems when we go back to town meeting in the fall and find out what our tax collection is and what our receipts, estimated receipts are, and whether we have a reduction in state aid, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that it's possible that those are the types of things we could take out of the budget uh, without, uh, without much of a harm uh, to any of the programs or any of the personnel. Uh, in terms of hiring, you know, it, I would like to take a look at uh, whether we could uh, restrict hiring both in the town side as well as the school side. I know on the school side, there are a number of uh, positions which are mandated, uh, you know, through SPED or uh, ELL, et cetera. Uh, there are several uh, uh, positions which are not, you know, whether it's a case of in a perfect world, we'd certainly hire those positions. Uh, but given some of the concerns and constraints we have, you know, maybe we can go a little bit slower in those positions and see what our uh, fiscal uh, situation okay. truly is and uh, uh, make decisions uh, at, at some later point. Okay, Kelly. Kelly, you know, I'm sorry I lost you. you you're on my screen. You moved around a couple of times, so it's it's hard no to get worries. Okay. <laughs> No, 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 no worries at all. So, you know, I, I agree with what everybody is saying, actually. I, I do I, I, I do think that, you know, we, we have to be cautious with what we do moving forward, especially based on what's going to happen in the subsequent years. Um, what that said, if school does open in the fall, those positions are going to be required for mandates. Um, and without hiring for those positions, we're going to be forced with cuts in regular programming. So I do not support any cuts to, to general education um, to support additional sped spending because of mandates. I just, just don't, I, if we need to have the mandates, we need to spend the money for it. What I would like to, what I would like to see or talk to the school about is what, what services are they able to provide right now to students in a distance learning environment? And if in the fall, we don't go back to school as normal, we don't need to hire those people right away because their services won't be needed right then. Yes, the folks that need the that need the outplacement, yes, we have to pay for them 100%. 100% we have to do that. But if kids are getting services in school and we're not having a traditional school environment, 
what services are we providing? And if they're not providing those services, can we delay their hiring two to three months and then save that revenue and put it into the budget? So I'd yeah. like to talk to the school about what that looks like and figure out if we can delay hiring that way. But if there are mandates like the the, the outplacements we have to do that have to that have to be done, I agree with moving forward with the budget as is with the caveat of being cautious, seeing if we can delay some of these appointments based on traditional schooling not coming back in September. Okay, Kelly, um, we do, we and, and for the folks at home, we do have the school community coming before us on Monday um, and we can talk further about to the school about what they have maybe in their back pocket as a plan. Um, I think, um, I think maybe one of the things that we can do as a finance commission is that we plan on meeting a little bit more regularly at a time that we normally wouldn't meet or um, it, you know, the, the late summer, early fall, um, making sure that we uh, kept up to date on revenues, um, the amount of money that we're getting in from the state, what happens to the budget, state budget when they finally get around to voting on it and that sort of thing. So um, let's, let's us at least plan on that and plan on having um, more, more meetings like this where we can make sure or that we feel comfortable with the amount of spending that's going on um, every month until we meet again in um, the fall for our a special town meeting, where, um, which I'm sure we're going to have, right? Um, so how is that for a suggestion? Do, do I have agreement here? You, you okay. all are going to have to give up your summer vacation, okay? I think everybody's having a staycation this year, Ann. I know, where are we going to go, Ann? It's <laughs> killing me. It's killing me. <laughs> We're going to be encouraging a program later this summer. We're assuming things open up where you do a staycation at a local hotel in Norwood. So, okay, okay. Yeah, we need to increase that um that tax. So yeah, let's get everybody okay. out of the hotel. All right. So let's yeah, move that's, on. That's okay. A pretty good suggestion. Yeah. Is we're all set to move on. Can all I ask right. one question? Yep. So um, we we we, I I I I have to. Confess, I'm not really sure about the rule um, the state put forward, but we talked earlier about a 112th budget. Am I reading the regulation correctly that if we were not able to have a town meeting, which it looks like we will be able to have a town meeting, but in the event that we were not able to have a town meeting, would the state, would we have to revert to a 112th budget approach? The short answer is yes. Mm -hmm. okay. And if I believe it's also one twelfth of the of the current budget, not the FY twenty one budget. It's so uh, not it less be, than it's an amount not less than one twelfth of the prior year's budget. So the the way it works is it's actually a nightmare for accounting because you get a chunk of change. So let's say your budget's one hundred twenty million. It's at least um, you know it's one twelfth of that, and you take that amount and you have that amount to spend in a month. Well, you have to start juggling payments around because normally we pay for insurance in July, for instance, to get a discount on it. We make a pension payment in July. So you start kicking payments off. You end up having interest payments. You got to work with your vendors. You can make it work. Um, you don't have enough money to pay all of your teachers, but you don't start that payroll till September. It, it can be done and it is done. It is an accounting nightmare for the accountant's office. Uh, and for the school business office, um, operationally, you won't see any changes. It's just a matter of there's a lot of behind the uh, behind the scenes bookkeeping to make it happen. Mm. Kelly, Thank you. With, with that 112 budget, like you said, I would imagine some of our expenses are cyclical, right? Like the school department doesn't do a huge outpouring of money in the summer. All of their money is spent from September to to June, right? Like they don't have a huge outpouring. How do you, how do you handle that? Is that do we incur late fees or whatever because we don't have the ability to pay them because we have to move those payments around? It, it's possible. It depends on what it is. I mean, you, you have to meet your payroll. That's where you really start saying, all right, you know, what what can you what can you freeze and not do a month down the road? But here's a challenge: if you say, all right, well, the DPW don't do any crack sealing. Well, then November rolls around, you can't get any crack sealing done. Um, you ha do have payments where you have to talk and see what you can move because we, we generally have to make our health insurance payment. We can talk to our insurance vendor and say, hey, can we still get our discount if we pay our insurance 
uh, you know, three months after. I mean, you can pay your insurance monthly. We pay it all up front so that we can get a couple percentage point discount. Same thing with the pension fund. The state is allowing us if we want to make our payment in December versus um, July that we can do that. That's something that we'd have to do. But I'd rather kind of get the money in now and make sure it's sitting there and earning interest rather than not earning interest. So there's there's a cost to a 112th budget. It's not just, well, just take 112th and call it a day. You start to see a cost in what you can end up doing. Um, the schools usually actually, they hold over their prior salaries to cover uh, July and August. And then right in September, you start seeing a big um, a big dip, but you have a lot of start of the fiscal year costs. And it's not just a rush to spend money. It's just, that's when a lot of things end up getting renewed is the start of the fiscal year costs. So we might have a software program that we pay the bill in July and they may be great. We may just say, hey, can we pay in September when we figure this out? And they may say, great. Or they may say, no, it's you got to pay us in July. Some of our fixed payments for trash, the MWRA and stuff like that, those we generally have to make uh, monthly. So that starts eating up um, a big amount of that 112th budget. So it, it, it can be done. It's just it generally will cost you money. And it's a nightmare of time on the accountant side for no real additional benefit because we can make whatever adjustments we need to make in October. And we normally do our special in October. We may do an earlier special depending on how things look, if we have a better idea. Okay. Alan. Uh, thanks, Ann. Uh, in terms of the 112 budget, uh, I believe if you look at uh, the bulletin, the bulletin number six, I think it says not less than 112 of the, right. of the 2020 budget. So what that means to me is that you're not simply limited <coughs> to <clears throat> one twelfth of the budget, you can make certain adjustments to that, you know, to pay some of these things that you say uh, would have to be paid, you know, uh, early in the in the uh, in the uh, fiscal year, you know, such as uh, some of your insurance payments, your pension payments, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, you'd want to make pension payments early so you can be, uh, you know, collecting, uh, you know, income on uh, that money which is invested. So I think there's a little bit more flexibility in the one twelfth budget. Uh, then you say, uh, it, you know, again, it would be a but the, the challenge. Easy Alan, thing. Um, Go ahead, Tony. I'm, I'm, I'm done. Go ahead. You know, and you're right. The challenge then becomes when you don't follow sort of a set monthly number, you're saying, all right, well, month one, we need $30 million. But then in August, we can probably get by with $22 million. But then it's going to go up to uh, $27 million in September. But all right, October, November, we can probably get by with $8 million. I mean, you're, you're, you're sort of making numbers up. And again, you, you got to ask yourself, what's the benefit? You know, how does this help us? If we, for some reason, can't have a town meeting, I mean, who knows what happens? Maybe the governor bans town meetings and we are just not physically able to do it and it can't happen. And then you make the adjustments there. There's no financial benefit to saying, let's just approve a monthly budget and wait until October and then settle on a budget in October after we've approved three to four monthly budgets. You also just wait to September, October to make the adjustments that way. And it's less work for the accounting department more sustainability and we don't have to sit there and say gee what do we want to pay in july what do we want to pay in august right. there's no there's no fiscal benefit to us for doing it that way it's always been a reserve a town generally don't have a problem meeting it this is a little bit um different where you just can't have a town meeting uh the 112 budget process the state does it's also used a lot in regional schools where you don't have an agreement on a budget because it's um multiple towns have to approve a budget so the last town i worked in we had a two-town regional district and if one town voted no the budget was considered not approved. So you were constantly going to a one twelfth budget. Generally in a town, it, it goes forward. A budget usually passes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, I, I don't necessarily disagree with you, Tony. I mean, my, my main concern is really very, very simple is that, you know, by the time we have a town meeting, be it in uh, September, be it in October, I want us to be in a position that if we have a real worst case situation, that we're able to handle that without making any major uh, changes, you know, be it, uh, uh, you know, budget cuts or personnel cuts or whatever. That's the last thing we want to do. But I also want to put us in a position where, you know, saving us in FY21 doesn't put us in such a bad position in FY22 that we're going to have to make major changes, the type of changes, you know, uh, in services or whatever that nobody really wants to do. So. You know, if we can go a little bit slower in the first few months, uh, you know, there's always, as I said, discretionary spending uh, for either side. And we can go a little bit lower in some of those the first few months, give us a little bit of a cushion. I think we'd all feel a little bit better uh, going into a fall town meeting. Absolutely. Okay. That's something we can definitely do. Okay. okay. Well, can, can I move on? Is that everybody okay with moving on? Good. 
Um, we're actually up to um, discussing the budget itself, and um, now we can we can do one of two things. The school department is coming in to us on Monday. If you want to put off the vote until Monday after we've talked to the school department, we still have a few more things to do here, including I, I think some reserve fund transfers. Do we have any of those, Tom McQuaid? Uh, the only one we have is the uh, that I'm aware of is the the one to pay uh, Norfolk Agricultural School. And we sent that to the selectmen for their opinion on uh, the 5th. We haven't heard back from them. Tony's telling me that we do have a few others that he needs to have done. Yes, um, we, so we, far, have I haven't seen coming, we haven't gotten them. We're doing the final reconciliation and we haven't gotten them to the selectmen yet. Oh, okay. So it will be after next Tuesday that we see them? Okay. Uh, yes. All right. So um, I, I'm, I'm going to start the, the, we can take a few minutes to discuss the budget itself. And, um, and I'm going to start things off here for a second. Um, I, I would like to know how we are actually going to present the capital budget. For, first of all, uh, let me put it, let me start this way. I, I really am uncomfortable if we're going to town meeting with a warrant that's a, or with, um, we're going to have a, a secondary motion and it's going to say, we want everybody to pass this uh, capital outlay budget, but um, we're not going to borrow, or we're not going to spend any money and we're going to borrow everything, even though it doesn't say that. So that's, that's where I'm coming from. So, Anne, and I think we can I think I can address that one pretty quickly. Yeah. The um, the capital budget, what we're pushing off to the fall, we're not asking for approval in June for those items and then just borrowing in the fall. The idea is that those items simply aren't being voted on until the fall. Okay. So what is your capital, what is the capital outlay budget going to look like? Because it's presented in the book. Correct. That's the full plan. And with the exception of the items that the, um, is the two school items in the MWA loan. That's what we'll be requesting town meeting vote on in the fall. There'll be a slip sheet we put in that says, here's the three projects we absolutely have to do. It's a couple of the school to IT projects, the vans and the MWRA loan, which if we don't get our annual approval, uh, we lose out on the low interest loan. So those have been identified as the projects we need approval for. Everything else can wait till the fall. So there'll be a slip sheet with, these are the only three projects, school IT, the vans and the MWRA loan that we are um, asking that those be approved in June. Everything else will go forward as normal in uh, October or when we have our fall special. Okay. So it's it's on the warrant, right? The, um, the capital outlay is on the warrant. Correct. And so your motion is going to be to pass only those two or three things, the school two of the schools and the other, and then you will continue it and we will yep. vote again in the fall. Correct, because we're not voting on them this year. We'll be voting on them in the fall. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, it, it just, yeah. All right. Um, anybody else on the budget? Yes, Alan. Uh, just a, a minor thing, and it only you know affects uh, the rates. But you know, because of the recent decision by MWRA to reduce their rates, will we in turn have to make a change uh, in our budget uh, to reflect that? No, because remember, our budget is based on our consumption and our projected use. So what we anticipate, and we think we'll be bringing rates to the board uh, Tuesday, if not the following week. Um, the impact of the MWRA reducing their overall cost increase, because remember, we're still a function of the system. So whether Correct. the system is up or down yep. can impact our numbers. So they could cut their rates 10% and we could still pay 10% more. We're looking at, I think, roughly a 3 to 4% increase. We anticipate that will decrease that by about a percentage as its impact on our increase. So if we were going to go up 3.75%, we believe it'll only be a 2.75% increase. Right. So the bottom line is it's going to, whatever it is, it's going to be minimal. 
Uh, for us, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. May I add on to that? Um, in, yes. In, so um, I believe that the press release is also indicating that that they they have a opportunity to defer the loans or the loan payments for the II program. Is is there an opportunity for us? Is, is there any fiscal implications for us through that program? Uh, so yes and no. If if we were to delay loan payments, all it does is it kicks them out a year. So from a credit rating position, that's not the best thing in the world. Do I think the rating agencies would come down too hard on us? Um, I don't think so because I'm sure with everything that's going on, a lot of people are doing it. But all we're doing is saying if we've got 19 years of debt, we just take a mulligan this year and it gets kicked out the following year. We look at the dollar amount for us that would be subject to it. Again, it might be a percentage difference on the rates. So we're not sure it's really worth it to kick that debt out a whole other year because we're actually looking at a fairly reasonable, not reasonable in a bad way, in a good way, a couple percentage point increase for water and sewer. So it looks like it'll be a good year going in. Um, if we would do that, we kick the debt out. We just don't really see a benefit to it because um, it all it is is just pushing your debt further out. And it's not a whole lot of money in the water and sewer um, number. If we were looking at a $5 million number or a payment on the school or something like that, then we might say, hey, there's, there's enough of a cash flow difference here to do that. Um, sure. So I'm not sure we're going to be going forward with it. We may want to do it and keep the rates the same uh, to ensure against any losses because we know we tend to come under on water and sewer. But our April numbers have actually been pretty good, better than we uh, anticipated on water and sewer. So I, I, at this point, the recommendation, I think, to the board when they set rates would be it's not enough money to kick it off um, another year. Okay. I'm just curious, um, ballpark, what, what, what amount of money are we looking at? I think if Bernie's on, he can jump in. I think it's around six hundred grand. It may be less because it's yeah, specific. Yeah, it is. It's not good. It, it is it's about, about six hundred thousand dollars. Oh, about six hundred thousand. Mark Good said. And Mark, yeah. have you heard from the credit rating agencies? I mean, generally they don't. They don't like that you're saying let's not pay our debt this year and let's kick it off a year. Uh, de that would definitely be the case. It would be a negative view by the rating agency. So I'm glad to hear you're saying that, Tony. That's. I wasn't yeah. looking forward to it for that reason, as well as it would be a whole lot of new debt schedules that we'd have to plug in. So, yeah, yeah okay. if this was five or six million dollars, we might say, hey, you know what, we can really make a difference. And, and at the end of the day, it would only be a for a potential impact on the credit rating for a potential um, you know, nightmare from an accounting standpoint. The impact on your actual sewer rate would be minimal and we're just kicking it down the road. And, and the effect of uh on the bottom line would be zero because you'd be reducing your rates as well as your expenditures. So, so it doesn't help our bottom line. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. We do, Anybody like, else? Sergeant, we do appreciate what the MWRA has done. I mean, out of a lot of quasi agencies out there, they did what they could do to mitigate their rate impact and they're being as flexible as they can be. So we certainly appreciate that for anyone that, works at the MWRA, make sure you let uh, everyone else that works at the MWRA know that the town really does appreciate that they're going above and beyond and doing everything they can do to help cities and towns. Did you get that, Bob? Thank you, Bob. I, I, I would uh, also just um, credit um, Mr. Cooper, who is actually um, on the executive board of the MWRA advisory board, more so than me, so. Okay, Bernie. Thank you. Thank you, Bernie. Thank you, Bernie. So, um, Madam Chair, e even though we haven't voted on the budget yet, I just want to talk about <clears throat> uh, a pro my proposal for town meeting on how they should vote. So, uh, I have on the screen uh, the the way we usually vote is uh, right there. It's a selectman. So, usually, we, then we, as a town meeting, would discuss everything all the budget items within the selectmen. Excuse me, I have a uh, race going on outside. So uh, so I would propose that rather than vote on the selectmen's budget and then the general manager's budget and then the finance commission budget, I would, I would suggest having town meeting vote on the general government total there, which is really general government administrative services and then have them vote on public safety and then public works. Uh, you know, you can still discuss everything in between, but it would be a way to minimize the number of votes in this kind of special year and get people 
I would have found meeting earlier. Okay. Well, I will take the and let does anybody have any comments on this? I think I think um, we should maybe mull this over and and see if there's any any repercussions to voting for that that way. Anybody? Okay. All right. Thank you, Tom, for that suggestion. I don't. What is the? What does the board think? Do you want so, to comment, Madam Chair? Yes. So at this point, what Tom is presenting to us is in, let's confirmation is in fact the budget that both the school department and general government as approved by the school committee and the selections board. The, this what we're looking at has already been approved by our other elected boards. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. Tony, they did the selectmen did vote the other night, right? Uh, I don't know if they took a final vote on it, but I believe the FinCom sends a budget to them and they send it to town meeting. Right. This is the this is the FinCom's budget. So uh, to me, uh, you know, knowing that both of those boards uh, generally agree with the budget, I would think you'd want to take a vote today and get it uh, on the books. I will make a motion. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Judy, I think. I'd like, I'd like to make a comment, and, and particularly for the audience here, too. This is a budget. It isn't the first time we've seen this. We have all been involved from day one with the five-year plan, what was in it, what wasn't in it. It's evolved over the course of many months. And even though three of us weren't on the budget balancing committee, we attended those meetings. So. You know, it, this has evolved over a course of a number of months. I don't know if we need to get into any of the details here. I mean, I'm comfortable with the budget as presented because I've been involved like everybody else. So I think we should go ahead and just approve the budget. It has to get to, um, you know, the massaging it and getting it ready for town meeting. So that's my comment. Okay. Now, Tom, did explain what you want to do again. Do you? Well, you for, 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 this, for this meeting, I would just like a, a roll call vote on the on the budget approval. But I, I'm just suggesting when we get to town meeting that one possible way we could uh, still cover the whole budget, but speed it up considerably rather than, you know, just look at that first section, that there, there would ordinarily be, I'm gonna just guess 15 votes there and you could make it one. And, okay. and obviously you, you can open it up for discussion, people, and it's, we can send a letter in advance that this is what we plan on doing. So uh, okay. I, it's, at least I get the sense that people want to still be deliberate and make sure that they understand the budget and make sure that they're they're voting properly but i get the impression people want to get out of there as fast fast okay. as possible yeah. too that's understood okay um once uh alan go ahead uh thanks ann uh i mean i happen to agree with the concept uh, tom has but one question i do have is that in general government using that as, as an example instead of taking 15 votes we're taking one vote that, but still, you know, uh, please, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm also assuming that a budget like selectmen, you know, uh, total request of uh, X and general manager total request of X, those, you know, sub budgets in and of themselves, you know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what the term I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say is, but they stand by themselves. It isn't as if you know, because you're covering general government under one budget, you could move money from like general manager to selectman to you know the town council, et cetera. You know, you know what I'm oh, trying to say, that, Tom. That's right. When when uh, when Ann makes her, uh, while well, she probably might e might even be doing her presentation uh, remotely before the meeting, but you know, the moderator will make it clear that the selectmen. You know, when we're voting for the general government. We're voting for the three sections uh, within the selectmen, 
Right. You know, salaries are restricted to salaries. The operations are restricted to operations. And the capital, if any, is, is uh, also there. So Right. Right. Okay. So it's not so it's not as if if you have a, a shortage in the uh, assessor's budget, you can simply take money out of the treasurer's budget. You still have to go back to town meeting, uh, you know, to do that. Right. There's some towns that that actually make one vote on the whole budget. Yeah. So it's just a question of, you know, the main thing is people want to make sure that we're transparent, that they right. have all the information. I think because uh, you know, we, at least on the general government side, we go to the uh, you know to to the trouble of explaining every change that's over a thousand dollars. I think right. you know, if people want to yep. do the work, if they really care, they they can get all the information they need. And obviously, even though you know you might discuss this general government vote at the same time, you can talk about any one of the these individual budgets. Mm -hmm. Okay. Judy? Yeah, I have one question. If we go with a bottom line, like in the general um, the general budget, I would assume, though, if anybody wanted to do any transfers on the detail of that, we would still have to go before town meeting. In other words, it doesn't give somebody carte blanche to say, okay, we voted on the bottom line, now we can transfer money in, within the sub accounts. Right. It's still it's, selectmen can only spend their salary lines on salaries. They can only okay. spend their operating on operating. Okay. Okay. Any more? Um, so, so this is Kelly. Do you, Kelly? No. Okay. You okay? You were shaking your head. I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> okay. Good. <laughs> so. Um, all right. So I would what need to... that was. It was a thumbs up. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> um, I, I do have one comment here is that, um, you know, uh, we can vote on this tonight. We still are talking to the school committee about several other things on Monday. We could re keep this till Monday um, in case you might want to change your mind. Um, but one thing that, that I'm a little unsure of, I thought that the selectmen were going to vote on it last um, on Tuesday <laughs> night. And traditionally, we have not voted on this budget because um, I, I guess traditionally the, it was that the selectmen have to agree on it in order to give it to us to, to present to town meeting. So if, you know, what do we do if they up and decide to make a change or something? Um, so I'm just, I'm looking for direction from the FinCom here. What do you want to do? Do you want to vote, vote or do you not? I guess I'm looking for a motion. I, I, yeah. well, I'm, go ahead, Judy. No, I agree. I agree that past practice, we always had the selectmen vote yep. first. Yep. We were always the last. Um, She's made a very good point, but at the same hand, you know, we're getting very late in the process here. Um, I know when the selectmen have come to our meeting, there hasn't been any discussion uh, otherwise. Um, I don't know. How does the rest of the board feel? I, I, I'm fine voting. As uh, long as Madam Chair, can I ask Mr. Mazuko when, when they, uh, when you did have the budget discussions pub publicly with the board of selectmen, did they did they make any changes? They did not. Okay. Um, did, Kelly, did I hear you? I, if it's the pleasure of the rest of the board, I'm okay voting on it now. Bob. Yeah, I was just echoing, you know, I viewed the uh, selectmen's meeting uh, on the budget and my recollection was, I don't recall if it was a formal vote, but um, there was discussion and I noted that that there was no recommended change to the budget um, by by the selectmen. So I, I, I'm, I'm comfortable with voting for the budget. Okay. Alan, you're comfortable? Uh, I would be comfortable uh, with the uh, caveat 
that I would like to see, uh, you know, as part of our motion, uh, that I'd like to see a list both from the general government side and the school side of discretionary spending, uh, which I hope is more than just a couple of paper clip accounts. So that if we do have some real concerns uh, in the fall and we're, uh, we're tight, that we can take a hard look at uh, whether we really do want to fund those discretionary items during this fiscal year. So uh, I guess I guess what I'm saying is, yes, I would support voting the budget now, but with, uh, with that caveat. So are you making a motion, Alan? I would make a motion to that effect, yes. Okay, do you want to repeat it from Molly? And uh, uh, I recommend that uh, we approve the uh, FY21 budget with the uh, provision that both the general government and the school department provide us with a list of discretionary items. So does that make it a contingent vote? Because that, what if that takes six weeks to come up with? We need to... No, it's, 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 it's not... I mean, it's, I think, we can I'm get. Not, I'm, I'm not looking. I'm not looking for the dollars today. I'm just saying by you know by July one. You know we want to have a list of discretionary items. By right, town meeting. Well, could we? Um, do you want to? You want to make this into two motions, two different motions? Do you want? Sure. To okay. That, let's it, do that. that would probably make that it simpler. Make it nice and clean. Okay. So make a motion. How about a motion for accepting the budget as it is? Presently, so moved. Second. Okay. Um, Excuse me. I have some. Hello. Yes. I just ran to get something. Um, in the past, Ian, I think you have that information relative to how the warrant is written. That uh, when the yeah. budget is passed. Gonna, yeah, I was going to bring that up. Okay. Okay. That should be uh, we're, we're, only do, we're talking about the budget right now. So, okay. Right. All right. So all in favor? All opposed? Actually, I got to do a roll call. Judy. I'm not sure we were talking about the same thing because if yeah. we vote for this budget, that particular um, item we want included with that approval is not there. Okay, well, why don't you can I just suggest when you make at town meeting the FinCon makes the motions so you can make the motion include whatever wording you want. I, I, I think that you're that talking about fine. the That'd be fine. Okay. So Judy, are you yay or nay on the budget? Yay. Alan. Yes. Bob. Yes. Kelly. Yes. And I am a yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Alan, you have another motion you want to make? I do have a, uh, another motion that uh, uh, by town meeting, I would like to see a list of discretionary items from the budget, uh, both from the uh, general government side and the school side and these discretionary items, uh, uh, you know, uh, our items, which don't do not have to be spent by the time of the next town meeting. Can I that, amend that motion? Can I amend that? We motion? haven't even had it. We haven't had a second yet. Oh, I seconded, it, but I'd like to amend it. Okay. Well, that happened before. <laughs> Go ahead. To, I, I'd like the I'd like the list at least two weeks prior to town meeting. Are okay. you agreeable to that, Alan? works for me so can can i just ask a, some more specific so like just for instance if you take the accounting budget accounting departments but you know obviously a small department but you know if we have five thousand dollars for conferences and five thousand dollars for travel so i mean do we want to you want to say like no one can go to a conference if it happens to Go in the fall, or you know, that might be a good idea. That might be an that, idea. You know, is that, is that is, a uh, thing? Just so you know, the intent of my uh, my motion—it's I'm not going to get into specifics, 
you know, that's why we have a town manager. That's why we have a school superintendent. You know, I trust that judgment to come up with things. Um, I'm not going to, in the motion, get down to, you know, nitty gritty detail. Uh, that's why that that's why we have people managing these departments. They can do that for us. Okay. So um, now we have a motion and it's been amended by Kelly. It was seconded by Kelly and then amended by Kelly. Kelly, do we need another person to amend the motion? I'll second it. Okay, great. Amen. Wouldn't want to be caught on a technicality here. All right. Uh, I'll set to vote Judy. Yes. Alan. Yes. Bob. Yes. Kelly. Yes. So this, and I'm a yes. And so this is going to be due to the FinCon two weeks before town meeting, correct? Okay, mm -hmm. just want to make sure. All righty, thank you very much. We can move on to the next thing, which is what Judy was alluding to when we were talking. Um, warrant changes in the motions. Um, if you remember, I sent you folks some information after the warrant came out. The on the warrant, there was a change of wording um, on the um, the article of that we would pre be presenting, which is the budget on the new RM warrant. Yeah, for 2021, it would be article number four. four. And um, if you remember, I, I sent you some information, whereas I'm going to read for everybody out there. Um, article four would say to see what sum of money town will vote to raise, borrow, or transfer from available funds in the treasury and appropriate from fiscal year beginning July 1, 2020 through July, June, I'm sorry, June 30, 2021 for the following purposes or take any other action in the matter. The old way um, was, let's see, the old way had a sentence on it and um, the last sentence of the article, the article was exactly the same up until this point. And it's the, the last sentence said, or a couple of sentences, said all sums voted for salaries are to be expended to conformance with the, in conformance, I'm sorry, in conformance with the official budget of the Finance Commission, unless otherwise voted by town meeting, period. All sums voted for new equipment shall be expended for items listed in the budgets approved by the Finance Commission and voted by town meeting. So I guess I um, so I'm going to I'm going to put that out to you folks to discuss. I think Judy has something that she might want to say on this. Yes. Um when I saw that missing uh, of the change, I looked back and did some research and that particular item, all sums voted for salaries and blah, 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 what you just said, has been part of the warrant for years and years and years. And the purpose of that was for my understanding, when town meeting made the vote, they voted on what they were told the money was gonna be spent on. This particular, um, two sentences put put in the warrant kind of kind of gives it a little teeth that you can't just take that money if you're not and, and spend it somewhere else. And that's so, uh, this has been. Uh, I, can I just comment on that? Mm -hmm. I, I think Mr. Plasco generally took the lead on making the warrant, and mm -hmm. I believe. His opinion was that the warrant was to serve notice about what we were going to be discussing. Uh, the, the wording of the actual motion 
you could you could have that wording at, at the you know in the very first motion that you know all sums whatever that thing says, but that's that's what the moderator says every time we vote. He says these are the three categories that we're even though we're voting the bottom line of the selectmen's page, we're voting you know these three individual categories from which people can overspend within those accounts but collectively cannot overspend the salaries in that account which th that i believe is the goal and the intent of that language which is more you know in mr plasco's opinion and i think i agree it's more appropriate in a motion than it is on a warrant okay well since um all of the members of the board won't be together at the motions meeting um I would be looking for a direction from you whether or not you want that on the motion for that uh, for the um, town meeting. Is, is well, that I think that for Judy, I think first of all, the uh, the warrant is already signed. Has that been this is yeah, the official sure. warrant? You can't yeah. change it anywhere. Right. And I know Bill has offered the uh, option of putting it into the motion, meaning the FinCom motion. And I think that's a great way to do it. Okay. So I would like to have that added to the motion when it comes to the motion meeting. Does everybody agree? Does anybody want to speak on this? Be besides Judy and I, Bob, Kelly? No. Okay. Do we need to take a vote on this? Mrs. Lango? Oh, can I say something? I assume, Anne, you're going to be at the motions meeting, correct? I'm assuming I'm going to be invited. Do, we can Tom, do I assume and, and, and tell me that? I just point out that we, we write the motions before the motions meeting. So, and I write, I usually generally write the motions for the FinCom. So, you know, give me the exact wording. I will put it in the motion and then, you know, the chair okay. can review the motions before the motions meeting. Okay, thank you. That's fine. All right, everybody okay with that? All right. Mm -hmm. so somebody, somebody wanted something? No? Okay. All right, next up on our agenda. I almost lost my agenda under all the paper. Um, okay, policy compliance pages in the budget book. Um, they were do, do you folks have your budget books with you right now? Yes. Yeah, uh, yes. Okay. You want to open them up to the policy section? It's um it's section 1 and we'll start with page 1 of FOA. Is this the section you're talking about? Uh, uh, financial policy compliance dashboard. I Tom, I can't read what's on the screen because the uh, I need to see the people. So the written thing is very small for me. So right, I put I put up the wrong thing. Hold on. Okay. Talk about this this report. Yeah, that looks that looks yeah. right. Okay. Yeah, it's the dashboard and trends. Section one. Section one. Okay. Um on the right hand side I found I, I'm sorry, I found a little typo, I believe. Um the on the left it says under board of assessors shall review the overlay surplus if uh, permissible vote to release surplus funds to the special purpose stabilization fund for the town's next decennial revaluation. Re on the um, other side, on the notes, um, I believe that the second line down should be releasing surplus funds to the special purpose stabilization fund. You've seen that the missing two on that. Anybody? Well, I know. Let me before we go too much further. I know Joe Collins 
sent me a revised version of this today, so I don't know whether. Oh, okay. All right. So that's just a typo, but um, I think take a look at. Um, well, let me pull up the version he sent. Okay. Financial policy. Okay. I'm sorry. So you're in in uh, over in this section and under the right hand column. Yeah. And and it's what, the third, see the row third numbers block, on the left. The third block down. Row six. Row six. You got to enable the editing. It just it's the second line in row six. It says releasing surplus funds. The special purpose. It should just be to the, which we haven't set up yet because we don't have any funds to release. But we'll get there one day. I'm sorry, the second line. Second line where it says releasing surplus funds. Yeah. It should be put the word to T O. The, oh, to the to right the here. Yeah. yeah, there you go. You got it. All right. Um there's a, a little kind of a did anybody else go through this and find anything that they were uncomfortable with or thought should be changed? No. No. Okay. Kelly, I can't see you folks. Hold on. Okay. Kelly, you're all set. Bob? I reviewed. I, I, I don't have any commentary. Okay. Al, uh, Alan? I'm Judy? fine. Judy? I'm fine. Okay. Um, the bottom of the first page, the last paragraph. Um, it says this policy is found in Article 15 of the town bylaws. Um, the Article 15 of the town bylaws describes, is the way I would put it, the capital LA and uh, group and their re responsibilities, but it, it does not describe the policy um, that uh, all non-recurring items which exceed one half of 1% of non-utility revenue shall be considered capital items. That is not in um, the bylaws. So if you want to take out that first sentence, then you should be fine, but it really is not in the bylaws. Me and the bylaws spent a lot of time together. So you're saying this sentence on the left? Uh, um, the sentence under notes. The, the, on the right hand, on the right hand side. That's it. Got time and went too far. Last paragraph. It says this policy is found in Article 15 of the town bylaws. That policy is not in the bylaws. I'm sorry. Back I just don't know where you are. Scroll down. Down. Okay. Last block. On page one. On what? On page, on page one. Page one. Last paragraph. The move your little cursor down a little bit. Last paragraph. Page one. Back up. Back up to page one. Well, when I go to page one, it's the very last thing is says yes, long it's term. The last paragraph. It's the last paragraph on the right. Where it says long term borrowing. 
Nope, back up no. to page. Are you on page one right now? How about this? This nope. policy yes, is right right. That's, right. That's, right. That's, it. That's it. Okay, I'm sorry. What What do you want me to take it, that first sentence out? Yes. All right, I just got to find it. Um, okay. You all set? Thank you. Sorry. That's okay. Um, on page two, the third, um, entry on page two, the third, uh, little block down, uh, it says, uh, debt shall not be used to fund any recurring operating or maintenance expenditures in the budget. And, um so is that so are we sure that that is so yes okay just wanted to check thank you um sorry, i just had to check on something here Um, I, I just want everybody to review and make sure that you're okay with the um, top of page three, the notes on that, on the right-hand side that start with as of April 14th. I want to make sure that everybody is comfortable with that. Mm-hmm. Bob? Yes. Okay. Alan? Yes. Judy? Kelly, I can't see you. I say yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, then that was my only changes. Okay. I will make sure that that gets incorporated. Um, all righty. Um, I just wanted the reason why I brought that up is that was a new piece in the um, in our budget books this year. And I just wanted to make sure that we had all read it and agreed upon it because we spent so much time on our policies. And mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure that we were in agreement with how we were follow, following the policies, okay? So I thank you for your patience there. Um, let's see, compliance. Um, FinCom budget book letter. Oh, um, I had written a letter and asked for you folks to read it and to offer some suggestions. And this letter is traditionally from the, um, for the folks at home, traditionally from the Finance Commission. And it's it's been used in different ways over the years, you know, um, if uh, just to give a little history basically of, of the process and what was going on during the year and how we developed the budget, um, I guess is a good summary of it. Um, but um, this year uh, I did ask for feedback. It's usually written by the Finance Chair and this year I did ask for some feedback from you folks. Um, didn't receive anything in the mail, so I don't know whether you're all okay with it. And I'd like Can to. You, this is Bob. Yes. When did you, when did you send the letter? I, I have to confess, I have not seen a letter. Mixed in with all those other emails you got in the last week? Um, oh, yeah. You know, Bob, I'd have to bring up my um, email. Um to find it. Judy, well, do you have any idea when we when I sent it? What day? Oh, hold on a minute, Bob. Maybe I can do it this way. Okay, hold on. 
Well, I guess I, my suggestion would be, you know, I'm, I apologize if I missed it, but um, if, 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 if the commission would bear with me, can I ask for the letter to be put on the agenda for Monday's meeting? That's fine with me. Yeah, uh, Anne, uh, I don't, uh, I don't remember seeing it either. No. Oh, okay. I mean, right. I could have missed it, you know, but. Kelly, did I totally you get could have missed. I don't remember seeing it either, but again, I could have missed it. Okay. Anne. Yes. Anne, is this yes. the letter that you were going to ask to be put in as the FinCom letter to the townspeople? Yes. Okay. I, I did see it. Okay. All right, I will send it out and if we can, uh, we'll postpone this till Monday. Okay. Is that okay? okay. Great. All right, I will send it out later tonight. So you can have late night reading. All righty, going on here. Um, reserve fund transfer. So we're not going to do that tonight. Correct. Okay, postpone that. Anybody have anything under other business? Um, I'd like to ask if Tony is still there. What is yes. the status of the um, Forbes Hill? Of the what? The status of the Forbes Hill? It is currently out to bid, and uh, I don't have the date that the bids close on uh, hand. Uh, if Kathy's here, she can jump in, but it's currently out to bid. We had a pre bid meeting, several um, folks attended the pre bid meeting. The, Bid package has been downloaded by a um, couple dozen uh, companies, so we're hopeful that we'll have um, something in a month or two uh, once the bid opens. Yeah, Kathy, go ahead with the what's the date that the yeah. bid uh, bids are due. The, bid, the bids are due on um, Friday, May twenty second at eleven o'clock. It is going to be uh, broadcast via NCM, and it will be posted on our website as well. We did have the pre-bid um, this past Monday, May 11th, at 11 o'clock. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, and in terms of how uh, Forbes is being paid for in the budget, remember that next year we have to make our payment one way or another, even if we were to sell the property, because we are carrying the debt for the year. We're using the uh, large deposit, about $625,000, from the prior bidder, which we foreclosed on, and then the rest of that cost amount is uh, allocated in the debt service budget. So assuming we do sell it, the FY, the following FY budget, the FY22 budget, that'll give us a little bit of breathing room in the debt service. I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. The, the bid opening is June 15th. We had done a 45-day advertisement on that. So it's June 15th at 11 o'clock for the sale of the Forbes. Thank you. Thank you. Alan? Uh, just maybe to talk about something you wanted to bring up Monday, but we can do it very quickly now. Uh, you know, we received approval. This is on the uh, Coakley Middle School uh, project. Uh, we received uh, permission from uh, MSBA to go out and to uh, hire a, an owner's project manager. So particularly with uh, with Kathy's help, uh, you know, we put together uh, a request for uh, proposals, uh, which is now uh, out. Uh, actually, it's a request for services, uh, which has now been published both in the uh, NOAA record as well as the Central Register. Uh, we had a uh, pre-bid meeting uh, on that. We had quite a number of people who have shown interest, which is great. Uh, so, we, so we expect to see, uh, again, I don't remember the exact date, so I apologize for that, but we expect to see uh, the, those uh, proposals to come in to us uh, sometime uh, uh, in the middle of uh, uh, middle of, uh, of May. Uh, we intend to make a decision on a, on an OPM, a town decision, uh, by the middle of uh, of June, and we'll then submit it to the uh, MWRA and hope to get approval in their July meeting to go out and uh, negotiate a contract and finalize the contract, I should say, and hire an owner's project manager. And after we do that, then we'd be in a position to, uh, again, it's a complicated process, but to go out and hire an architect engineer, uh, which I hope to do by the end of the year and then be off and running. Okay. Um, Ms. Hay yes. 
Uh, it's Kathy. Um, just want to let you know we are accepting the um, RFSs on the owner's project manager. That's the May 22nd date when we're doing the Coakley for the OPM. Okay. So, so you're going to have a, a meeting soon, Alan? Uh, we will have uh, two meetings. We're going to have one meeting, uh, you know, of a subcommittee where we go, uh, we review all the proposals that we've received. We would have rated them and we'll decide which firms uh, we want to shortlist uh, to interview. So then um, probably a little less than a week after that, we'll then uh, have the interviews uh, of those shortlisted firms. It'll be a minimum of three and we'll make a decision on which one uh, is our top one that we'd like to begin negotiations with. So that's done by a subcommittee? Uh, the subcommittee will be the ones who uh, make the decisions and then we will then go uh, and uh, negotiate a contract. Okay. Um, who's on the subcommittee? Uh, it's, uh, it's myself, it's Tony, uh, Margo Frezek, who is the uh, principal of the, of the Coakley, uh, Paul Riccardi, and I know I'm missing, oh, uh, Tom Maloney, uh, Board of Selectmen. And Kathy, Kathy is there as a, uh, you know, as not, uh, not a voting member, but as a procurement officer, she has to be involved in the process. It's a good team. Okay, good. Hey, anything else? That's it. All right, Bob. Um, just echoing to um, Alan's earlier points about um, the out years, um, FY 22, 23, and so forth. I know that um, um, last year, a very important document we did was the long-term financial plan. And I, I realized that, that currently that, that, that planning is, is probably very challenging given all the questions about revenue and spending and things such as that. But I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that perhaps in the fall, um, we should revisit our financial planning. And uh, perhaps by that point in time, we'll have a better, better idea of what our, um, our, our, our long-term revenue and spending pro programs look like and be able to um, put that plan forward. And it may help us guide our decisions for what I think Alan is correct, what could be some very difficult years in FY 22, 23, and, and perhaps beyond. That's well, I will be happy to leave a note for the next finance commissioner um, chair. Oh, okay. That's fair enough. Okay. <laughs> I don't want this job for two years. <laughs> Kelly, do you have anything to share with us? Bob, I'm sorry. Are you done? I, am. I think it's a very good idea, actually. Yes. Kelly? Um, I'm all set, and I just wanted to say you did a terrific job running this virtual meeting. I know they're not always easy, and there's a lot of people on the call, so I appreciate that, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to say thank you to everybody that was involved in this um, this year's budget, 2021 budget. Um, you know, we were all we were all surprised when um, you know COVID-19 hit, and we were we have all been concerned about the decisions that we made, but I do feel that we can move forward with this budget. And um, as long as we are vigilant, we will be able to get through this next year and then into the two following years that may be a little tough. But we've done tough before as a town and we can do it again. And we we'll take care of the folks in the town. And okay. one more thing, just, just everybody be safe. Take care of yourselves. Nice yes. meeting. Yeah, agreed. All right. So this is the end of our meeting. Thank you very much. And we'll sign off from Norwood Cable. I'll, I'll move for oh, adjournment. Uh, yeah. Move I, for adjournment. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and one more before you adjourn. I, I, I think before the meeting, when uh, Emily first got on the line, people might have recognized her. But uh, Emily Chambers is our newest finance and accounting employee. So. She uh, comes to us from uh, the U.S. Army and Massasoit Community College. She has her master's in public policy from UMass Dartmouth and her bachelor's from Stonehill. So uh, she started this week. We we hired her uh, virtually. So uh, we physically have seen her. She actually exists and uh, 
<laughs> very enthusiastic and uh, hopefully you gonna had make a great time tonight, right? Gonna help us make my job easier still. Okay. Thank you, Tom, and hi everyone. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Emily, look 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 forward to meeting you in person. Likewise. Hopefully that uh, that that army background you can keep Tom in line. That will be much appreciated. It's not Tom I worry about keeping in line. It's more Tony, but we'll see. <laughs> okay, so do I have a motion to adjourn here? I made the motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Alan, Bob, yes. Kelly. Yes. Yep. All yep. right. Thank you very much, everybody. It was a long, Thank you. one. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.